gentlemen, this is a test stream. Don't worry about what the hell we are saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wait, did he actually hit the button already? He probably did. Oh. Oh. Well then, hey, hi everyone. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. Welcome to week five of the MNLCS. This is going to be game number one for today between the UM Dads and CSS Fighting Saints. We were having some technical difficulties with the stream before. However, we are now back up and things are live. With us today is going to be your play-by-play uh, -play caster, Dreamer, and the color caster, Fen Fen. And Dreamer, what do you think of today's matches? We had some massive roster changes that I think we should probably discuss. Um, I mean, honestly, you are the person that's in charge of a lot of the M and LCS. So you tell me, you just told me a little bit ago that we did have some roster changes. Um, according to you, Snow Kane is the new top laner for the UM Dads, if I did say that correctly. Um, as well as, what was it, Cuckarino Kukur has changed. He was on Chicken Chasers, and now he is on UM Dads. And I believe you said one more person I do not remember. Uh, here, let me double check because I have the actual list right here for everything that was swapped. So the jungles got swapped between both teams. Okay. The tops got swapped for both teams. So actually, Snowcane is not a new top laner. He is the one that used to be on Chicken Chasers, but with the name change. Okay, so Snowcane is a name change. All right, that's good to know. Yeah. And when we get to the Chicken Chasers today, there will also be some things to mention over there because they had overall swaps, but we are getting into Champion Select. All right. Like like we said today, it is the UM Dads, UMND Ads, whatever you want to call them, versus CSS Fighting Saints. Now, if I remember correctly, Fighting Saints are two and one, or sorry, two and two at the moment, while UM Dads are one and three. Oh, damn. That is it, correct. That is still, that's, uh, I want to definitely see UMN Dads pull out another win for today. They did win their last game versus St. Cloud, so they are kind of on a streak at the moment. But the first ban for UM Dads was the Karthus. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting ban. I haven't really seen Karthus get utilized too much throughout the tournament just yet. In fact, I don't think he's actually been picked at all, unless if there's a game I'm forgetting about. I, but, I mean, never rests. from every... From every game I've seen, I haven't seen a Karthus picked or banned, so this might be just a target to pick towards H Nub. A nub? I wanna say I'm just gonna say a nub. Rengar though was the counter ban for Fighting Saints. We These aren't little sense. slow bands coming out, and as I say that, Karma is gonna be the next band for UM Dads. Now the Karma and the Rengar, I'm not too surprised on. They're far stronger picks, especially Karma just because she's so good at helping teams rotate around the map, which is what makes her so strong to coordinate setting. But I wonder how CSS is going to try and retaliate with that ban. Will they go for another support ban to try and get away with things such as maybe the Zyra or maybe even a Malzar if they still see it as strong? Or what will they go for? Yeah. Well, we will have to wait and see how that goes because Kha'Zix is the next ban. So that's both Rengar and Kha'Zix yet again banned away and will not be played this game at all. I've seen a lot of Rengar and Kha'Zix bans. It, it's yeah. kind of like a picker ban for them at the moment, but Morgana is going to be the last ban for you and Dads. All right, with Morgana being a ban, I know that Morgana is... She's not too pick a band worthy right now, but from what my guess, most of the bands on the side of the UM Dads are just kind of like targeted bands rather than something more meta oriented, except for maybe the Karma, because I'd say she is far more meta within this. But as we've seen throughout the MNLCS so far this season, a lot of the picks have been personal picks for these people. They don't really adhere too strongly to a meta, except in the top lane. That's the only one that I've seen be very constructed around a meta all right well the victor was the last band for fighting saints and gragas is going to be the first pick for um dads interesting i really i'm really hoping this is not a mid gragas because the last time we saw gragas he did go mid and it did not really work out for the team zach is going to be picked up for the side of fate uh fighting saints and we are waiting to see what they will pick for the next one, it's going to be a Poppy Hover, and it is going to be locked in. 
Oh, Poppy and a Zack. So that's going to mean a very strong engage and pick potential since Poppy's very good at single target lockdowns. But I think Poppy could also work more as a backline peel since she could stop the Gragas from his body slam while trying to better enable Zack to lock down whoever he wants because she could stand right where his elastic slingshot is about to land and stop anyone from dashing out, but everyone could still flash out if they have it up. Well, I do, I do like... Poppy, I mean, they saw the Gragas, Poppy was chosen, so I'll, we can't really have a lot more dashes or anything of that sort on the side, excuse me, of U of and Dads. But Varus and Oriana are going to be hovered over. This is actually the first time I haven't seen a Varus be banned right off the bat, and he is going to get picked. Yeah, there were some changes to the Lethality item, specifically Edge of Night and Yomu's. They had it where their damage was slightly reduced, Yomu's in the form of the Lethality being reduced by 5, and Edge of Night having the AD directly reduced, and also its reliability and spammability were also decreased. So it makes it so that it's not nearly as safe to play the long range casters like Varus or Jin. However, it looks like they're going to retaliate with the Callista. Will that be locked in? Um, It's very interesting to see Callista. I mean... These guys are kind of going for that engage comp with the Zach and the Poppy. I mean, those two right there, very tanky. So I'm kind of hoping for someone out there we go, like the Jin and the Zareth. Those are perfect. Those two can, you know, push in the, or do damage in the back line and not really have to worry about getting ganked or getting flanked from the other side because of Poppy and Zach being super tanky. Yeah, I have to say, I'm so happy that I'm not playing in this game right now, because whenever I have to deal with a Jin and a Zera together, it really tilts me, just because of how easy it is for them to combo their ultimates together. The Arcane Right and the Curtain Call just give an immense amount of range to where they can kill you outside of your own screen. All right, Graves is going to be hovered over, as well as the Nami. So... I'm assuming that, so by the, by the looks of it, we see the Oriana obviously going mid. Gragas most likely going top. Graves yet again is being hovered over, so that is going to be a jungle Graves. Or it also could be a jungle Gragas too. They could be swapping that top and jungle. I don't see the Graves top really fruitioning, really working, but we'll see if it is a Graves top. If it's not, I mean... It looks pretty well to me having the Graves Jungle and the Nami to get rid of that disengage from Poppy, Zack, and whoever else the last member of Fighting Saints will be. Yeah, the only thing I don't like is how Nami is really the only person who can reliably disengage, and it has to be with the Tide Caller. Unless if she can land a very good bubble, which if I do see a very good bubble from Flaz this game, I would immediately give MVP over. As long as they still win the match, of course, because if it's TSS that wins, one of their players will get the MVP, and it looks like Malzahar is the final lock-in. I like the Malzahar a lot because we have the Poppy, we have the Zack. They are going to get engaged. They're going to go for that back line. They're going to be all in that team's face, all in you and Dad's face, while Zareth and Jin are going to be, you know, hitting from, those, from the back line, hitting from that long range. And if anyone, anyone decides to come over and even get close to the back line, Malzahar is going to ult them and be like, nope, you're not coming anywhere near my team. We're good to go. So I'm really, really liking what Fighting Saints has built for themselves today. Yeah, and with these, they're just going to be finishing up whether or not they want to change some Mastery's runes or summoner spells. And everything seems a little standard, except for the current summoner spell with the mid lane. I'm not going to say which one, since it's not revealed for another 7 seconds. However, it looks like you were right, thinking that's going to be a jungle graves rather than a top lane graves. Which means that it's going to be Gragas versus Poppy. How do you think that's going to play out? Gragas is going to have a real hard time with trying to get in poppy's face and be able to do damage however he is gonna probably do really well within the first two levels i mean first two three even maybe up to six just because he has that cast he can just throw it he can poke but poppy does have her passive does have that shield so we will have to see what she goes for in that lane they are very kind i mean they are kind of dead even but with a little more ap on the side of you and dads so uh i mean we will see how fighting saints is gonna go i'm honestly like 
if we're going to see who's going to win today, I'm going to give it to Fighting Saints because I like how their team comp was built. With UM Dads, they have Graves, they have Gragas. Those guys kind of want to go in, but you have the Oriana, the Varus, who kind of want to stay back, and then you have the Nami that kind of just want, has, is that has that disengage. Yes, she can heal. Yes, she can CC, but I don't know. I just don't feel like UM, UM Dads really built their comp effectively. I will completely agree with you there, and if anything, I feel like they should have banned away something such as Poppy or Jin instead of the Karma, and they picked up the Karma for themselves, because if they had the same exact composition, but trade the Nami for a Karma, I feel like that'd be much better with the added mobility that Karma would offer to that team. I'm not sure if you would agree with that. Well, you also have to remember this, is if Karma was going over to Fighting Saints. That gives Poppy and Zack huge, like, even more engaging tools than they already have. So I like the fact that they banned the Karma, even though, obviously, we wouldn't have known it was going to be a poppy Zack, you know, for, for the side of Fighting Saints. But if they banned away, or they didn't ban the Karma, that Malzor could be a Karma as well. You, could, you also have to remember that. So... That's even better, even though Malzahar does have that uh, that suppress with his ultimate, Karma has shields, and she can shield everyone. She can boost anyone. She can stun anyone. So I like the Karma ban. I definitely do. All right, that's a very good point. And now that you mentioned that, I do agree with you a little more. I will stick to thinking that something else could have been more valuable than a Karma ban, because I just don't feel like she's that contested, or at least swap something out for the Karthus ban, or the Morgana ban. Then again, having a Morgana Black Shield on top of an Ulted Jin or Xerath would be very scary to have, because then you just don't know how to deal with them. Yet again, I feel like those were those target picks, or sorry, target bans, so we don't know. These could be, or those players could be phenomenal on those champions. But they banned it. We won't know. We are going to go ahead and get into game. It is the UMN Dads versus CSS Fighting Saints. Like All I said, right. I'm going to give this over to Fighting Saints. I feel like they built their comp really, really well. And as I mentioned before, I do completely agree with you. So it seems like for the first time in a while, both me and Dreamer are actually agreeing on which team we think won during the pick band phase. However, the pick band phase does not tell the entire story. We have to wait to see what happens in game, which I feel like the most impactful lanes for this match is going to be the junglers. You have Graves, who is a very powerful or a very powerful farmer who has incredibly strong early game ganks, not with crowd control, but through raw damage. And then you have Zach, who come level nine, he can gank from just about anywhere with the extreme range that he has. That's very true. So it will be up to these junglers to kind of dictate how the early game is going to go. But, I mean, you also have to remember this. Oriana does have that mana that she... Or she's very mana hungry. Xerath, he does have the ability to gain some of that mana back through his passive. Jin and Malzahar, that's going to be a really tough lane for Varus and Nami. Yes, Nami does have the sustain that she can keep Varus alive. But Jin hurts. Those crits, those fourth autos hurt. So we are going to have to see who kind of wins in this early game. And it's really not looking good for... Um, sorry, for UM Dads. But yet again, this is all, all uh, predictions. We will see how the rest of the game will go. Who knows? I could be completely wrong and they can dominate. The entire game and then we we have a 20 minute ff never know i mean i doubt an ff would happen because most teams seem very dedicated to play the match completely throughout within this tournament series however you are right in the sense that anything can happen we could predict that the fine saints are going to win and then suddenly the um dads just turn it around and really show us that they have the potential to take the game into their own hands and it looks like we have Gragas and Zack, or Graves and Zack, sorry, I see the Gragas, I immediately think jungle. We mm -hmm. have the Graves and the Zack, both starting at their blue buffs. Do you think that they'll be going for full clears to get as much early experience as possible, or do you think they may be looking for early ganks towards top or mid lane? 
I feel like Graves would probably go for that early gank because, like you said before, he does have that power. He has the raw power with his auto attacks, doing a lot more damage than a normal auto attack from any other carry. But... I don't know, like, he, it's gonna be very hard for him to gank that top and that middle lane just because Zerith is gonna be poking from a range. Hockey is going to be, you know, kind of being safe as well so maybe Graves is trying to go for that bot lane to get that Varus and that Nami started really early yeah we do see that they're both going straight from blue to wolf so suggesting that they don't want to do a full clear and may just be rushing from buff to buff to hit level three and then look for a gank over we already see some gate or some trading going in the bot lane yeah we do see a little bit of damage the Malzahar did take a lot just trying to get those minions to attack the Varus and it was not an ideal trade for the bot lane. We do see Gragas, you know, as well. They are getting that level two, and Poppy is doing a little bit more on the damage side than Gragas because Gragas is, yet again, he is melee. He did not open up with his flask, with his Q, so he wasn't able to poke down early at level one. Yeah, and it looks like the early prediction on the jungle pathing was right. They're just going for double buffs to level 3. And maybe they're going for the scuttle crabs on both sides of the river. It looks like Zack is actually looking to get a gank out. Let's see if it happens. He is waiting around in that brush. Yeah, he is coming up to the to the top lane right now. The stun onto the wall. Gragas is taking a lot of damage. He flashes away, but first blood is coming over <laughs> The side of Bait are fighting Saints and Poppy getting that this way a phenomenal but Graves with the counter jungle on that bot lane getting the Jin and that actually might hurt a lot more than the Gragas. Yeah, especially because right now the minion wave is in the favor of the UM dad, so that means they can push it up to the tower and just deny that much experience. Meanwhile, Snowkin had the ability to teleport straight back to Ling, so he didn't really miss much experience, he just gave some gold over. Yeah, first blood gold is a lot though, but yet again, that is the AD carry, not taking for not having a lot of CS, a lot of gold that he is losing. So I think uh, UM Dad did end up winning in the end with that game. Maybe you're not getting first blood, yes, that hurts, but having a Jin, you know, kind of far back in this lane phase is not that ideal. Yeah, that is a very good point, and. One thing I want to talk about, because we actually haven't mentioned it yet so far, is the fact that we are seeing completely different starting items with the change of meta toward the AD carries. Instead of being the Dorn's Blade, we're actually seeing Longsword and three pot stars. Now, what do you think is the full cause for that? Well, we were talking about this before in Lethality, yes, even though it did get up nerf with some of the items. Having, you know, two extra pots in a lane is actually not that bad yes you're losing out on health yes you're losing out on the lifesteal from the Doran's blade but a lot of the items will you know start or will build into leave out those lethality items and that's all that is for that bot lane is lethality that's all bot lanes are kind of buying or building at the moment is those lethality items so it's not that bad to have those long swords to start with I think another big part of it is the fact that most of the supports you'll see in the bot lane is not these all-in supports, but actually never mind that point, we see another gang top lane! Oh, that was a really good stun, but the Zac also did miss his elastic slingshot, he is taking the turret, taking a lot of damage, he isn't gonna get his passive off, he will live on a shrivel of health, but that is another gank in the top lane, The Gruckus has to go back. That was actually a very close call right there. He is down his helper though, so that was very smart of Sinos to go straight back to the top lane because now we see that denial of experience and farm towards Snow Cane, and he'll have to try and rush back as fast as possible to make sure he can collect at least some of it to stay close to the level of Krell. Meanwhile, we can see that Graves noticed that gang top lane is taking his sweet time counter jungling Sinos right now, just taking his Gromp and will probably be back in off here. He decides to stay a little longer. He will be caught out. Nah, he is still taking that Gromp. He is doing a little bit of damage. He does take the Gromp. He is leaving right now. He is going to pop the plant so he knows that the Zac is right behind him. And there is a little 
a little group coming down the bot to make sure that there's no fighting going on between the graves and the Zac, but nothing will happen. And we do see a more damage going onto that Gragas again from the Poppy. Poppy finishing, or not finishing, she has her Bambi Cinder now, so she will, or Gragas will be taking a little bit more damage being just even next to Poppy. Yeah, and it's also going to add to Poppy's weight here, meaning that it'll be easier for her to just constantly shove into the tower and keep pressure onto Gragas so that he won't be able to really roam or try and put any place elsewhere on the map. And while she already has his lead, she's basically just cementing that lead right now. She's cementing it for sure. She is not that, you know, high in her mana, but she, Gragas is at 50% of his health. Oriana's He's coming up. gaining a little bit back from his passive, but Oriana is coming to that top lane right now. Kinda hovering around, Gragas taking a lot of damage, and Poppy is diving down, has the flash away! Gragas is at a, a quarter, you know, a sliver of his health, Oriana will have to use her ultimate to try to get the Poppy down. The teleport from the top, from the mid lane is actually coming up right now, but it will go over to Death Rogue. Death Rogue will pick up the kill on the Poppy, and Oriana, that's beautiful, while Zack at the bottom lane is trying his hardest, he is gonna take enough damage for his passive to pop. And we do see a Graves here as well. A lot of damage is going on to this Zack. Zack is yet again a sliver of health, but Zareth is actually down there doing a lot of damage, getting all three of his ultimate shots down, and they have to back away now. And that is four oh, in the bottom. Flash into all of his heart. Oh my god, it was so close. Again, Mars Kakarino was so close to death. Zareth flashed using his entire combo, but Nami was able to save his life. And it looks like four of these guys will stay down in his bot lane trying to get this tower for first blood to hold. Or first they tower to have, They have enough minions. There is no way that they won't be able to take this tower, especially with another wave coming in right now. Will Oriana be able to stop it? I don't think so. Oriana won't be able to stop it. Her presence there is not really threatening. And there it goes. First turret gold going over to the side of Faint, uh, Fighting Saints. All right, so throughout that entire set of exchanges, the biggest mistakes that we saw was going to be the fact that Kaka Rhino thought that Sinos was still going to be alive and would acquire his Q in order to finish him off and bring him to his passive. However, it ended up missing all the blobs completely and made it so that Sinos actually lived. If he saved his Q for when the blobs were gathered together, it would have been a free kill. And actually, no, we see Cliff being caught up by Krell. Krell is doing a lot of damage right there. He's getting that Graves down very low. Graves having to use his ult to back to gain a little bit of distance. But Gragas is up in this top lane and it's a Oh, I'm sorry, the explosive <laughs> that's missed, but Oriana Shockwave does good land and Krell or sorry, Graves will end up getting the kill for practically nothing. Krell losing his life over a blue buff that he didn't even get. Yeah, and we are going to see that that's now a 2-0 Graves, which as we mentioned before, Graves has a lot of front load damage, that's all he offers, and just giving him these skills is going to make him even further ahead. He's now level 6 compared to Sinos' is level 5, however, we do see that Sinos is trying to take away Graves' red. Whether or not Cripple is going to try and counteract with that and go into Sinos' jungle is another question. It looks like he's hovering right around that barrier to get an idea whether or not he wants to go for it, most likely just taking the scuttle right now in the meantime. Well, we do see that Cyrus is taking, like he said, there he goes, there's the red, and he is kind of hovering down that bot lane again. He is level 6, so he will be able to, you know, CC the bot lane for a little bit longer, but he is going to go ahead and go back. This Zareth, though, doing so much damage to this Orianna, and is not really, not needing a blue buff at all to, you know, keep this going. Orianna is in a bad position right now, gets hit with the stun, the... And everything in between Graves is behind him. Oriana is running for her life. Oh, and he's gonna go ahead and miss the, his Q. And Oriana will get the kill onto Zareth. That was a great ganking opportunity for Graves. And Oriana again getting another kill under her belt. 2 0 and 1, as well as Graves getting that assist. So, very unfortunate for Zareth not being able to get that kill. And this is where I'm just going to go ahead and say that the Teleport Summoner spell was not exactly the best option right now, at least in that specific scenario. Yes, it was really good because it helped him try and roam over towards the bot lane, but if he had Ghost, he would be able to get much closer and secure the kill onto Death Row. However, he's now throwing out his ultimate, trying to look for something, ends up missing. 
and everyone is doing this little dance around the dragon pit right now, trying to secure it for themselves, and it looks like it's going to be going over to the fighting saints, unless if they try to steal this. Well, you do have to remember that Poppy is up in the top lane still. Yes, she does have the teleport and fighting saints are going to go and start the dragon. It is a mountain drake. Graves is on the other side as well as Nami. So this is going to be a little bit scary. They are coming up to the river from bot side. Nami Double is going to go ahead and land that bubble. Gragas is there. The Mars ultimate is going to land as well. Graves gets one kill. Kakarino gets another. And that and Pabu comes in. Being able to blast away two of the enemies with her ultimate. But that was not beneficial for fighting saints. Real and dads will go ahead and start this dragon for themselves and will end up probably getting it as everyone is backing away from the surviving members of fighting saints and the really weird part about that was that they had good ward coverage they had ward coverage all around the bear or the dragon pits so they should have seen it coming and should have known that they had to back off immediately once they saw the teleport coming in from snow king however they tried rushing the dragon down instead and were probably thinking in their heads that they could easily turn around for a fight, even though most of them were low. It ended up costing them a lot of deaths, plus the dragon, and now potentially this bot turret too, as you see four members down there, and... Nub! Really in a lot of danger. Nub almost dying right there for the full combo, but Ariana does have to back away right now, and like you were saying earlier, that dragon fight did end up costing... Uh, fighting Saints a lot. They lost their bot tower, they lost their blue bug, almost lost their mid, and there was a tower dive coming from the Orianna. Orianna actually will not get targeted from the last shot of the turret. Gets out of turret range and is so close to death. And she is being chased some, down. We do see some pings from the side. From the side of Fighting Saints, Fighting Saints is gonna go ahead and flash. The Mouse of Heart is gonna go ahead and use the ultimate. The Space Saints is coming out too. Orianna is going down to the Q of Malzahar, and so unfortunate. I don't know how the, the tower dive happened. I will have to look at that a little bit later, but that was very interesting to see an Oriana tower diving a Zerg. I'm gonna say real quick, what happened was she tried to flash in and throw her command attack out to Zareth, however, he flashed right over it, which is why I was just completely speechless when it happened. It was an amazing play by Hanub, but at the same time, they both flashed each other's abilities, because Hanub tried throwing his combo out to Orianna, and she also flashed over it, so it was a tower dive that ended up having amazing flash dodges from both mid laners. Well, it did end up having Orianna, you know, the death of Orianna did end up happening, so... Not so good for the side of Young Dad. Even though it was the support, Malzahar still does a lot of damage, especially when you get some items underneath him. Yeah, and he will be scaling up slowly throughout the game, as we have seen before with Zareth. He is a very hard scaling champion to where the moment he gets his third or fourth item is when you really have to fear him, especially just being able to throw his Q off in very long range. It's essentially a magic damage form of what we've seen of Varus for quite few patches, or for the last few patches. Meanwhile, top lane is having a bit of a pressure now between Token and Krell. Oh, this has been going on the entire time. So much aggression. All of, the, all of their abilities is being used against each other. No one's really going down. Both of them are at half HP, but Orianna again is up in this top lane. Waiting for the to use the command shockwave, and Corel will go ahead and flash out of it. So a flash for Oriana ultimate, but it does look like Fighting Saints are gonna go ahead and push for this mid lane, or instead they're gonna go ahead and oh. try to get this Oriana out of position. But Oriana was able to speed herself up and get back to her team safely. And they actually didn't spot her right there because the ward came up right after she passed its vision range. And this entire time we can see that Snowkin is just shoving up the top lane trying to add some pressure forcing Krell to go back. He is without teleport, but we can see Sinos is hovering right around the top lane as well. So Snowkin will have to back off unless he's willing to try and take the risk. And it looks like actually the fighting system will turn their attention back to mid lane! Oh, this is going to be a quick fight we have. All the ultimates, both Zach, both Varys, or sorry, not Varys, Zareth's ultimate as well. Graze will be shut down by the Zareth. Orianna's coming down super close. Zach flashing away, fear of dying. But it does end up going well. I won for zero for the side of Fang Saints. 
And Poppy wasn't even there. That was a kind of a 4v5. No, 4v4. Graves will, uh, Gragas was not there either. So they are going to go ahead and try to get this tower. But with Gragas there, they might not actually get it. No, they're going to go ahead and they get should it. So that's another tower. That is a tower for the red side. Yeah, I'm just going to quick look over at top lane. We can see that Poppy is also trying to shove the wave up right there too. But she is backing off, so it means the tower is not really under pressure of going down. It is only about one-third of its health gone. And just looking across the map, we can see that so far, the UM and Dads have been setting up a lot of control wards throughout the top side of the map. Which means that that's probably where they're planning to put a lot of their focus. They're probably going to be looking to group up, take this mid tower, and then rotate up top with the vision control that they have. They're probably going to be having Flez stay at the front to keep the vision control even further into the fighting state side of the jungle. Mm -hmm. Since we've been seeing a lot of aggressive plays from them, especially with the amount of roaming that Death Roach has been doing. All right. Well, I feel like now that the laning phase is over, we're going to... We're gonna see a lot of these teams end up grouping up. I do see like, that the top, the both top laners are kind of staying to that top lane. I don't know if they've got the memo that laning phase is kind of over, but we do see a lot of aggression for this mid lane for both sides. I feel like right now, Fighting Saints needs to stick together. They have the better team fight. They have the opportunity to set dive a lot of those champions, as well as being poked from the back line. And they, do, they need to start grouping up. They need to get together because that's where they're gonna excel. And once they're able to do that, I mean, they can take towers, they can take objectives. The next dragon is coming up in 20 seconds and it is an infernal. So that is something that is gonna be fought over and really contested. Yeah, and you're saying you won the top players to come into the fight. Here they are, Gragas and Pearl are in. Oh, wow. Xerath is gonna die right away. Nami's actually the focus right now. Xerath, or Varus is gonna go ahead and flash away as well. Gragas is in the back line, not really doing much. The Poppy ultimate is gonna go ahead and miss. And Poppy is having to run away as well. Zack actually going back in to try to kill the Nami. Nami is gonna live. And it was Kakarina that took down Jin. And Zack going down as well. And that was a weird and interesting team fight that's going to the side of UM Dads with Poppy being the last one alive and as Zareth and Mousehard coming back up from death. Yeah, and with Zack being down, that means that there should be a free and front dragon for the UM Dads. And that team fight also started off with a very awkward initiation attempt from both teams, missing their skill shots completely, and then just throwing out all their damage to each other. End up having to work. Nub was the first one to die. He got caught up by both Snow King and Death Roach using the Shockwave plus Body Slam combo. And right after that is where we saw the bit of the Clown Fiesta happening. But as you mentioned, we are now in the mid stage of the game. We want full fight fights to happen. That is what we got. And we got to see a glimpse of how the team fights are going to be going down throughout both of these teams. Do you think it's going to be the exact same pattern throughout the rest of the game? Or do you think we could see some form of strong initiation attempt from the Fighting Saints, like you said, back during champion selects? That was a very weird initiation, like we said before. There was two ultimates being used just to kill Nub. And Nub did end up, you know, he wasn't there. He wasn't there for the scene fights. He wasn't there to poke down anyone. If Nub was there for the 5v5 engage, it could have been way different, I feel. But because he was taken out so quick, it was a 4v5. Zach, there was a lot of miscommunication going in, uh, coming from the side of Fighting Saints. Zach going back in for Anami, not even getting the kill on that either. It was, it was really weird. I do want to see another 5v5 team fight, but I feel like Fighting Saints still has the chance. They still have the ability to win those team fights because if they had this there, they had the mo they would have more damage. And we do see the Zach trying to last slingshot himself in there, trying to get the Orianna, and he's actually gonna have to flash away from the shock or from the command shock wave. He is using his let's balance to get out of there. He a lot of flashes going in, but Orianna will get the Zach again. And I, yet again, I feel like a lot of miscommunication is going on with the with the side of fighting saints. Yeah, they're going very over aggressive with these plays. Before we saw that Hanabo was having very poor positioning, sending way too far forward. The so Salami get caught by Death Roach and Snowkin. And this time it was Sinos going in for something that didn't really seem necessary. He just jumped in using Elastic Lane Shot, missed completely, and then stayed in, bringing both Flash and Let's Bounce just to try and survive and still end up going down the process. If anything, 
He should have just saved his ultimate and the flash in order to make sure that he could at least have it for the next team fight. Well, I do like this a lot. We do see that you and dads are going to go ahead and try to get this top lane, but everyone else on the side of Fighting Saints besides Zach is on this mid lane and do end up getting the second tier turret. The, the Varus ultimate is going to go ahead and miss Nami's tidal wave. Is gonna go, it is going to hit, and there's still so much going on in this top lane, but on the They're side... They're at the inhib. Yeah, they are at the inhib. The side or uh, Fighting Saints are at the inhib, with Quag is only, the only one to defend. He is going to go ahead and flash in and use his casket but nothing will come out of it poppy is stopping the backs for uh fighting saints and you and dad are trying the hardest to go back and it looks like uh fighting saints are going to actually keep going the last the command shockwave will go ahead and land onto the zack the Donald Graves will take that kill and it's interesting because both poppy and zack were trying the hardest to stop the backs but everyone else on did not get the inhib for mid. They kind of just took the inhib turn and left. But at the same time, getting a turret for one death on the side of Sinos is very much worth it. You have to agree. Oh, I do we agree, but I feel like they should have gone for that inhib. Both Poppy and Zach were stopping those backs, were not letting them go, and they were taking the bait. They were they were fighting the Poppy, they were fighting the Zach. I feel like that inhib turret in mid could have been gone. And then that would have been way more worth it than just getting that one in hit turn. Yeah, that is very true. I'm not sure if they couldn't see everyone inside of the UM dead, so they weren't sure whether or not people had backed yet. That could have been the threat. So they could have thought some people started to back, we need to get off. Which, if they don't know, playing safe is usually always better than playing aggressive. As we saw before, that's what cost them a lot of deaths. So they're probably trying to learn from their mistakes and go with a little bit of a safer bet rather than going for these very aggressive, very risky plays like last time. The main thing I don't like though is that we saw the Fighting Saints roaming up towards the top lane to try and look for catching out the UM dads who were still up there. But the entire time, there was a minion wave bot lane roughly the size of four full waves attacking the bottom tier 2 turret that no one decided to try and go for. That was a massive wave that could have given a lot of golden experience, especially to someone such as Hnub, who, as we mentioned before, is going to be a lot of the damage on this team. And yet, they're not really focusing or allowing him to gather the resources that he needs to be effective. Well, I will go ahead and... I'm gonna go ahead and look at these items right here. Nub is going back. Actually, he's not. He's gonna go ahead and stay in this mid lane to try to poke... Um, you and Dad's out a little bit, and it looks like Mouse Heart getting a little caught out has to flash away while Zach is trying to protect him with the Elastic Slingshot. Mouse Heart is trying to ward, and I give him credit for that. But you need you need that buddy system because you're gonna get caught out, and then you're gonna die or have to waste a flash. And honestly, right now Zach is not gonna be your greatest buddy. He is level nine compared to Cripple's level eleven Graves. If you're going to have anyone be with you, it should be Krell. He is level 13. He's also a poppy. He can stop anyone from trying to go in on you completely. I mean, he's uh, poppy. You're, you're absolutely right. It does look like uh, you know, the dads are going to go ahead and kind of huddle around this dragon again. Another infernal is coming up in the next 10 seconds. Saints need to, they need to position themselves. They can't be putting themselves in this corridor. They need to get in that in that river but it does look like Rockus is going to go ahead and get caught out here a little bit of damage going on to him poppy and zach are in that back line right now but everyone else on the side of saints isn't really doing much actually nami is going to go ahead and go down bars does end up getting uh popped by the ultimate of mouse hardy he's actually going to get flashed on and zach is going to get the kill poppy is going onto the graves right now as he's flying to the graves trying to get out zach is going to go down it but his passive is going to pop there's a lot of damage going onto this base. He's gonna try to dash away, but Krell is gonna go onto the Oriana. Oriana being so low and is gonna end up dying. So that is a three for one on the side of Saints, and they are gonna go ahead and get this Infernal for free. Unless Cripple does have Smite, he could try and go for the wall and steal no, it. But they are they are pulling it out, so I'm gonna give him that much damage. It's really good to them. We do see the cast coming out. Ooh. I did not see the smite. He didn't actually, Zach did not use the smite thinking that they would get it without any contest. That was very close. 
Uh, we Snow do. Kane almost took that away from them. We actually don't have the ability to see the outline of Rogus's explosive barrel, so for all we know, it may have been just outside the range, so they didn't worry about it either way. That was still, uh, from the caster side, that was still way too close. But that's what I'm talking about. That team fight was really good. They were able to do so much damage. Nami positioning wasn't really, wasn't really ideal. She was in that, in that front line with Graves and Gragas. So she was taken out first, and Malzahar was able to go ahead and you know stun Kakarino or suppress Kakarino for the entire duration. And Kakarino had to leave. He had to get out of there, but ended up dying in the process by the Zap. So. I like it. Their team fights are that's what they're meant to do. Saints his team fights are supposed to go like that. Maybe with a little less death, maybe saving the gin, but they did end up winning in the end, getting a lot out of it. Now speaking of Kokarino and Jin or Annex Soviets, right now they just had a bit of a power spike in their items by finishing the edge of night. Yes, we talked about earlier how it was really nerfed heavily. However, it's active is still so powerful, the fact that you can just simply stop the first crowd control effect that hits you. That, as right now, we can see, the curtain calls are going up, and there's nothing you can really do to stop that. The, actually, three, two ultimate, both Jin and Zerus ultimate is going to go ahead and power. Jin is actually going to get caught by the Varus ultimate. Kakarino is going to go ahead and take him out. A very weird positioning for the Jin of Flash and the explosive pass is going to land on the Gragas. The command shockwave as well, taking out the Zerith. And now we have Sloppy coming in, teleporting inside, getting rid of Gragas with her ultimate. But that was a very weird team fight. They're actually still in this mid lane trying to take that turret. And it looks like dads are going to go ahead and take the turret while Zack is backing. And it was a two for none for dads. Dads ended up getting two of those kills. And those two kills were the carries. And it no, sucks. I'm it sucks am... because Poppy doesn't doesn't have that damage, and so does Zach. Zach and Poppy are those tanks, and you have the Oriana, you have the Vars, and they're able to poke you out, so they had to get all that turret. Yeah, and while getting the turret is really good, I'm actually really surprised! Both the carries on the side of the Fine States were down, and yet the dads decided to not go for Baron. They had ward control, there was only one ward near the red buff, and they didn't even go for it. They just simply took tower and left. They could have gotten far more had they tried to go for Baron because, again, all the damage gears were down inside the Fine Saints. There's not much that you can really do to retaliate at that point. It was essentially a free Baron opportunity that they let fall through their fingers just because they figured a tower was safer. Well, like you said, some teams like to play that safe, and that's how... I, to be honest, that's how dads have been playing it this entire time. They've been letting the engage go on to them, and they've been using the counter engage by taking down those carries. So they are kind of playing it safe, and that's okay. I, I like they took the tower. They weren't really going to do anything else with it. They bought, they backed, and now they're just waiting for the next opportunity to either take an objective or for that next team fight. Yeah, and as you mentioned, with them just simply doing the counter engages, they have a team fight that's really good with They have Nami with the Tide Caller, they have Varus with the Chain of Corruption, and you also have Gragas with the Explosive Cask. All three of those lures are very good at disengaging fights and trying to pick off whoever it is you want. As we saw before, Kokorino used his ultimate in order to lock down ex -Soviet. Now, never mind that, we actually see Sinos trying to go in on Cripple! And Let's Bounce is gonna go ahead and get caught again. Oriana's actually getting stunned down, but that does have to flash away. And the Command Shockwave going down does take out Zaren, and the Graves ultimate will take out Zack as well. Poppy having to flash out and getting in the middle of all four of them. And that was a really weird engagement. Grog is trying to get in on them, and they he won't end up getting either Malzahar or uh, Jin, but they are gonna go ahead and start this Baron. Yeah, and there are barely any wards around from the side of the Fine Saints. The best thing to do is just try to shove the waves on the side lanes to make it so that there's not as much tower pressure immediately after Baron, which it looks like that's what they're going to do. They're going to be shoving up top wave, and I imagine they're probably going to be backing and shoving down the mid wave next. Meanwhile, you can see that the dads are going to be backing, resetting, gain some more items. I imagine, yes, we do see the Last Whisper onto Varus, and we're actually seeing an Iceborne Gauntlet onto Snowcane. While that is actually a pretty good item fact of 
or in terms of adding damage to Gragas's build, I feel like there are some better options just because it's not really being threatened too much by the Jin. The bigger threat right now is mostly from the Zera, as well as the Mazar, to be honest. So I feel like some more magic resistance would have been better than going a heavy armor item like the Iceborne Gauntlet. I don't know. I feel like that's not as bad as you think, just because Gragas is going into into the team. He's going to be able to, you know, belly full, uh, belly slam in there and get, you know, even proc his Iceborne Bot Gauntlet. So that's slowing someone. That's adding more CC to the side of Daz that they already have. They have a lot of it with the Horiana Shockwave. And as, as I'm staying in the Celeste Bounce is going on to the Zag. Zag is taking a lot of damage and has to try to get out of there. He's been, you know, trying to last a slingshot the entire time. Bobby is actually going to go get and get hit by the Nami Bubble and the Body Slam as well. Gragas is now in the middle of a lot of teams and Zerath and Jin's ultimate are going to, you know, pop out. Jin's ultimate gut does get stopped short by the Nami Tidal Wave, but it doesn't really hurt. Uh, they don't. It doesn't really hurt Dads as much. Yes, they are about half health. A lot of the team is about half health, and they do have a lot of the Pokemon. But they are going to go ahead and back away and go and head towards the Dragon, which is an ocean at this moment. Yeah, and the one that's going to be very difficult for the side of the dads is the fact that the Fine Saints have a lot of wave clear in the Mazar and the Zerith, and admittedly, Jin also has some pretty good wave clear. It's just the bulk of his damage is going to be from his auto attacks and his Q, which he needs to get close range in order to give off, which, as we saw before, the dads are really good at pulling the trigger the moment that Exovia gets out of position and gets anywhere too close for them. So, honestly, he should not be trying to wave clear. He should be staying back and waiting with the curtain call and with his W in order to try and pick people off and look for a potential pick. Alright, well we do see Daz trying to take down his boxer. Zareth is actually gonna go ahead and aggressive flash and they are gonna actually get rid of Kukarina. He's getting down so quick but Let's Bounce is gonna go on to the Nami. Nami's gonna die as well. The Graves does get stunned by the mouse part but Oriana will get the kill onto him and we do see Poppy trying her hardest to get some damage onto this Graves. Graves still being so close to death Actually, Poppy being so close to death as well, and Oriana will end up getting the kill onto the Poppy. So it is a two for two. The support and the top for the bot of that. All right, and we now. You see, Gronkus actually uh -huh. going to go ahead and continue doing a lot of damage to the heal from Jen. is going to get popped, and Gronkus is, is, is just being able to stun lock for days. This is Zach, and Zach is not going to be able to do much. The teleport onto. The, one of the Zach bombs is gonna save him just for a little bit, but he will end up dying to the Orion again. Orion being 9, 2, and 8, having that rabbit on, having the Merlinomicon, the Luden's Echo. Definitely an interesting choice with the Luden's Echo, but doing so much damage. Yeah, most of Orion's damage is AoE, so actually getting the Luden's Echo isn't too bad because it only increases your AoE damage even further. Plus, it adds a little bit to the wave clear, which I mean, Orion doesn't need the help, but it's still nice just in case you're being thrown back a little bit because you don't have to stay in range of the command attack plus the dissonance. You can set just route the attack and then back off immediately to stay a little bit safer and still get good wave clear off. Plus, the movement speed is always really nice, especially against this very heavy engaging team with, as we mentioned before, the Poppy and the Zack. You know, it's a lot of people down very easily, and we are seeing that the Fine Saints are still clawing their way back into this game very slowly. They just need to be able to find the right fights, which what happened in the last fight that really helped them out was the fact that they had the numbers advantage at the start, and they need to be able to pull that off again. Alright, well we do see a lot, of, a lot of poking coming onto this mid lane right now. We do see Zach trying to, you know, try to stop the top push from happening and get it back into their favor, but we do see Dad's pushing a lot in his mid lane, trying to get that in hit turret. I mean, and this is another thing that's happened is Saints took that in hit turret a long time ago. We do actually we're gonna see the curtain call getting popped for Jin. Jin is actually not gonna get stopped. He did end up popping uh his edge of night, sorry. And uh, even the Zareth using his ultimate too, not really hitting anyone. And I feel like that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to poke these two down. 
or these this team is trying to poke get poked down a lot but it doesn't really end up helping them in the end yeah it's mostly because they have the nami and the young people back up and at the same time the only people that are really standing aggressively towards the front are Gragas, and actually Oriana's getting caught out Oriana is getting caught out the Malzahar ultimate is going to get caught and she is going to go down to the Zack and Zack is that was a really good call being able to get them but we do see the rest of dads being pushing his turret and they will get the in-hip turret for the death of Oriana actually Poppy is going in getting Pucarino Pucarino getting so he's so close to death but that's a double kill going from going on to the grave grave doing so much damage trying to get trying to get everyone down he will end up getting the triple kill Varus gets another kill Varus gets a double and that's an ace going over for UM dads and that was going to be definitely one inhib going down, and they'll most likely be rotating over towards the bot turret next. Unless if they want to try and go for an end right here, they do have 25 seconds, and they could easily have Snowcane tank the turret. I don't think like they're going to have the Snowcane tank instead. Not the best choice because the minions may go down before they can Okay, never mind. These turrets are going down really fast. Oh, we have Graves, you have a Mars. That's it. It's going down. GG's coming from the side of uh, Fighting Saints, and that's game. You were meant that taking the win for the fighting seats, and I believe that is their second win of this tournament. Yeah, that means that actually both teams are now in an equal standing of two and three. So, I mean, even though it seemed by stats that the dads had the game throughout the entire match, it was actually fairly close. You have to admit, especially in the late game when these team fights were happening full five on five, things were pretty close just because of the composition that the fighting saints had. But the dads were really smart and able to pick the exact fights that they would want, making it so that the less numbers they had within the people fighting, the more or the higher of a chance they had at winning said fights. I don't know. I feel like a lot of the engages that came from the fighting scenes probably should not have happened and that they did end up losing a lot of team fights because of it. But I do agree with you that dads did end up picking a lot of the team fights that they wanted to fight with the counter engages as well. I'm going to give my MVP to Oriana, even though, yes, she is a carry, but she was able to get those command shockwaves off on the right time on those right people, getting Zareth, getting Jin, even getting Poppy and Zack off of her, doing so much damage. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Death Rogue. He does end, or deserve that MVP from me. I completely agree. Death Rogue did an amazing job. And we also say that Death Rogue was one of those players on the dads being able to pull off those very aggressive attempts, especially when it comes to roaming towards the top lane, helping out Gragas. There were a lot of early kills onto Krell. And also being able to survive that pick from Zareth onto her with the counter gank from Graves coming in to really help out. She was able to get really ahead in the early game. She got a lot of very high damage focus items, the Loon Psycho, Meryl Namicon, and the Rabadon's Death Cap, finishing off with the Void Staff, just to go through some of the MR being built on Sinos and Krell. But she was destroying the backline. You saw in the late game fights, her Shockwave into Dissonance was doing immense damage, especially to Soviet and Hanub, who didn't really have much in the line of Magic Resist. And it's just she did an immense amount of work throughout the entire game. So I agree with you. She deserves the MVP by far. All right. Well, with that, game one is over. We're going to go ahead and take a short break. When we come back, I believe it is Pocket Picks versus Chicken Chasers. I'm going to go ahead and confirm just a moment. It is. To make sure, yep, it is UMD Chicken Chases versus UMN Pocket Picks. So when we come back, those who those will be the ones that are fighting. So stick around.
We are back with game number two. It's going to be the UMB Chicken Chases versus the UMN Pocket Picks. Right now, we can see that the Pocket Picks are three and one in the standings, while the Chicken Chasers are two and two. Now, last time that we saw the teams being this close in the standings, it ended up being a pretty close match with the game actually going to the team that's currently lower in the standings with the last match versus, or of the Fighting Saints versus the Dads. Do you think the same thing will happen here? I mean, we, we were talking about it earlier. We like the other team comp from Fighting Saints. We thought that they were going to win, but Dad's, you know, ended up proving us wrong. After that, to be honest with you, I'm not going to be saying who's going to win, who's going to lose. Anyone could bring their A game today. It could be the closest game ever. It could be a shutout. I don't know. I'm just ready to see some League of Legends. Oh, yeah, no, it's definitely fun to watch these matches happen, especially as... The games progress throughout the weeks. We actually see the teams get a lot more cohesive in their ability to communicate with each other and pull off very team-oriented plays. And now, we did mention that the other team, the Chicken Chasers, also had some roster changes. It The main changes to note is going to be Zyx swapping over from the UM Dads over to the Chicken Chasers. He is the new jungler. And I believe the only other change is with... Actually, no, I think that's the only change for the Chicken Chasers. Well, it wasn't... Um, oh, Kirk Kirk Rhino, Kirk Rhino and Quincy Adams also swapped. Yeah, okay. Because I yeah. was like, didn't you say that they were a swap? Yeah, I did. I, I just forgot for that quick moment. Thank you for pointing that out. But no with that swap, I'm wondering how well that these players are going to be able to communicate with their new players. They all are from the same college. So they have been playing together for quite a while at their respective clubs. It's just whether or not they'll be able to communicate on the same level as they would otherwise. Well, we saw you and Dads, they had their roster change. They pre they played pretty well. So if you're if from what you're saying is true, I don't see them having any problem being able to play well with each other. Yeah, and it looks like we'll be going into champion select in just a little bit. Okay, never mind right now. All right, All right. Radar, like you said, we are in Champions League. We're going to go ahead and see how or who gets picked or banned for today. We must we all make our see another Karma being banned out. We saw this again with the UMA Dads, but this so Chicken Chasers are going to do go ahead and take a leaf out of their book and say, no, we don't like that Karma either. We're going to take it out. Yeah, it seems like the yeah. UMD teams really just do not like Karma overall. Dear that's or... It could just be that both the Fighting Saints as well as the Pocket Picks have someone who is very good at Karma. Meanwhile, we can see that Scion is getting bad away from OLOXO. We saw that he played Scion last week, I believe. 
How well did he do with uh, Scion? He did pretty well from what I can remember. I'm I'm just trying to recall from memory. I reckon. Again, you saw how it was and I was trying to remember the roster changes. Don't take my word for it, people. Fair, Either way. That's fair. We do see this. Uh, TF is going to go get hit, go ahead and get banned as well. So League of Legends will not be playing that TF. And Nocturne will be banned away from Band Ribbon Essence. Lie. As well as Graves. They are focusing on Ribbon Essence right now with Nocturne and Graves. They're like, no, Ribbon, we've seen how you do. We like, you know, you. we know you're a great player. We're going to we're gonna cut you down to size as much as we can. Yeah, and I think this respects what we saw how impactful the junglers were in the last game, but we also saw how impactful the mid laners were. Specifically, Death Roge on Orianna. Right, and the Victor is going to be the last one getting banned, and Varus is the instant pickup for, um, sorry, for UMD Chicken Chasers. I am so sorry. Chicken Chase. So Varus picked her ban. That's that's how it's been. Every time, pick a band. And with a Varus comes a Jin. Always yeah, like that. It's either Jin or Ash. And that's that's kind of how the meta is for bot lane right now. Varus, Jin, Ash. It's, it's like basically... a rock, paper, scissors game. I mean, I'm surprised with how much of a Zelda fanboy you are that you didn't point out the Triforce of League of Legends right now. I mean, I rock, paper, not everyone's a Zelda fan, so I'm just going to go with rock, paper, scissors because everyone knows how to play that game. But we do yeah. see LeBlanc and Kha'Zix being picked up for the pocket picks. All right. I, like Le it. I do like it a lot. Kha'Zix LeBlanc? and Rengar weren't banned this time around, so oh, sure. Kha'Zix was get, is picked up. LeBlanc, I want to see how LeBlanc is, is going to work here. I really like it. No, I haven't seen really anyone play LeBlanc. At least, like I said, I haven't seen it. But Poppy and Yasuo are going to get ahead and get Whoa. picked up from Chicken Chasers. I have not seen a Yasuo throughout the entire season so far, I think. Have you? No, nope, definitely another, not. That's another new pick then. And this actually means that unless if they go with an, a magic damage dealing jungler, it's going to be a full AD team. Unless if they go a very damage heavy support like Malzar or Zyra. But I slightly doubt that because I don't think that either of those supports would go really well with a well, maybe a Zyra. Yeah, Zyra no, will I... definitely work well with the with the Yasuo because of the knock up from her ultimate and popping being able to push anyone away will help with that as well. So I I would like to see a Zyra. Zyra will help out. Even just having a Janna on the team will help out as well. But we do see, obviously, yet again, going back to that rock, paper, scissors, Varus, Jin, Ash. Jin is going to be picked up or is being hovered on the side of pocket picks as well as Nautilus. So Nautilus and Jin. Are That's getting... most likely a Nautilus top lane, I'd imagine. That is definitely a Nautilus. Actually, we don't know that. I've seen Nautilus support. Nautilus can support. I'm not going to, you know, not going to, what, how do I say this? Say no to that. I'm not going to, it's a flex pick. Yeah, no, it's still a very good flex pick. And for all we know, they could go with even a Maokai top lane and then have it be a double tank. That is very true. We do see Elise getting kind of hovered over. And I like that because that's what we were talking about. It was going to be a full AD team unless they picked someone very AP heavy for that support or that jungle role. And Elise is a very, very AP heavy jungler. So I do like that with the stuns from her cocoon and just being able to damage on at full HP and at low HP, get that damage off and get it off right. Yeah, especially with the amount of damage that Elise has early on in the game with her level three power spike, she can go from cocoon to her venomous, well, cocoon to her double Q with the form change and just completely lock someone down and destroy them. If you build a lot of early magic pen, especially in your runes, and then there's also a Thresh picked up for Gavin 97. Thresh, I like it. You know, trying to go ahead and pick out someone. Maybe pick out that Jin. Maybe pick out that LeBlanc. Stop the Cosmix from jumping in. Stop the Nautilus from hooking in as well. I like it. I like I, I like it a lot. But that's what also Poppy's for. Poppy has the her set of that presence to be able to stop LeBlanc, stop Cosmix, stop Nautilus. I don't uh, like. I feel like they have a lot of disengage from the from Chicken Chases right now. <gasps> Please lock it in. We've seen Burning Case go two weeks in a row on Kled. Let's make it three. Come on. Lock that in. 
I mean, he like we said, he was doing, doing really well in Clad, uh. but you were right. It was a Maokai with the double oh. tape, the Maokai and the Nautilus. So maybe the Nautilus. Yes, there it is. So like I said, I, I told you, I've seen Nautilus support. It's a thing. It's going to happen. Maokai for the top lane versus the Poppy. Elise versus Kha'Zix. Yasuo versus LeBlanc. Jin and Nautilus versus Varus and Thresh. I will say I'm slightly sad though, or I'm wow, slightly sad. What? Mm -hmm. I am slightly sad just because Burning Case has had a really good showing onto Kled, and you have to admit, every time that there's been the Kled in these games, it's been extremely fun to watch and cast, especially when you hear Kled screaming at the top of his lungs, running straight into the enemy team. But this time we have the double tanks, and it's also double tank top lane, so maybe we'll be able to see that but noodle fights that everyone always enjoys watching. Well, if I remember correctly, Maokai did get a little bit of a nerf with his saplings. Saplings won't be able to do any damage when they fall to the ground, but when they're chasing you, do be careful because those things still end up slowing and doing a little bit of damage. But Actually, I like it. I like it a lot. Who do you think is going to win for today? This time around, I'm actually going to be giving it over to the blue side just because... I really like Poppy versus the Kha'Zix and the LeBlanc. And while you mentioned that Thresh is very good for making picks, I feel like the Elise and the Poppy are good enough for that. And Thresh will be more a second line of defense for the Varus and also anyone who is diving. Because you forget, Thresh has a Lantern that can literally pull anyone to safety who has gone too aggressive. Specifically, that's going to be mostly Yasuo and Poppy. Elise has a Repel to save herself. Yasuo, when he goes in, he usually can't get out that easily. It's the same thing for Poppy, unless if she uses her ultimate, which you don't want to have to use every single time you want to go in as Poppy. So having the Thresh there allows him to go for the more aggressive plays while having that safety net. All right. Well, we we were talking about how defense is the really good offense today, but offense has been winning a lot. So I will give it over to the pocket picks. I feel like they have... The Kha'Zix, the LeBlanc, those are really good early game champions. Jin, yet again, does a lot of damage. And Nautilus and Maokai, those guys can CC anyone into Infinity. So I'm going to go ahead and give it to uh, Pocket Picks for this one. Fair enough, and I can really see your points. It's It really is a close matchup between the two compositions. The biggest piece that I'm honestly seeing is going to be the Poppy and the Elise versus the Kha'Zix and the LeBlanc, because I'd argue the Poppy Elise are the two biggest pieces for the side of UMD Chicken Chasers, while the biggest pieces for the Pocket Picks are the Kha'Zix and the LeBlanc, because they're the ones that will have to carry the early game. I feel like it's going to be about this mid lane right now. It's going to be Yasuo and LeBlanc. They're going to try to push each other out. They're going to try to push their lanes in so they can go and gank for the other, the other lanes. If either one of those guys start getting at least two kills, it's going to be very difficult for the opposing laner to do anything about it. LeBlanc is scary. LeBlanc does a lot of damage. Even though she did get a little, she did get nerfed within these past, past two patches, she still hurts. She still will be anywhere at any time as well as her passive, or sorry, her ultimate being able to mess with you and do play mind games. Yes, a lot of people do believe that, you know, it's not as mind gamey as it used to be. But still, sometimes you'll see that LeBlanc being able to pull off that little mind game or pull off a flash or something because they're trying to scare someone. I really am focusing on this mid lane to see who's going to gank, who's going to get ganked, and who's going to start, you know, winning that early game. All right, and in terms of the LeBlanc's clone, I said there's also a lot of hidden value in terms of being able to spot people out because it's a global ability that you can place wherever you want. So in a way, you could use it just to simply spot out, make sure the enemy is not doing Baron, not doing Dragon. You can check to see where the jungler is because if it sees it, it will follow it until it dies or follow whoever it sees until it dies, which it's essentially like a... Oh, I'm trying to think of the word. It's Kalissa's W, the little soul things. Mm -hmm. It's like those, but you can place it wherever you want on the map, rather than having to go there yourself. So, it's incredibly useful for vision. Meanwhile, with the Yasuo, I don't think even if he gets fed, he'll be that useful, because as you mentioned before, they have the double lockdown of Malkin and Nautilus, who will CC people for days, and Yasuo has to get in melee range. The only way he can do that is by dashing through people, which, as long as the positioning of the UMN pocket picks are played out well... 
they'll always have the tanks in the front, which a Nautilus to lock down Yasuo literally just has to auto attack him. That's it. <laughs> and then Malachi can easily follow up with his W. Nautilus can follow up with his Death Charge or his Hook. And honestly, that's going to spell out death for Yasuo no matter what he does. The only way I could see Yasuo being a very valuable asset to this team would be either in making picks or split pushing. I'm not sure if you would agree with that. Hmm, I don't know. Like it, like I said, it's. I feel it's a very, very much about this mid laner because yes, Poppy has a teleport, so he will be. She will be able to go ahead and do her teleport plays, but Malkai does as well. I don't know. It's really dependent on, like I said, this mid laner. They're able to Our get in, get out, and Ooh. do a lot of work. We do see a DC. Um, I believe it was the Poppy that DC'd. Yeah, that was OLOX01 Poppy, which we're actually not seeing a pause yet. Unless there's a pause on your side, it's just not showing on my screen yet. So right now, I do not see a pause. I don't but... see anyone moving, so it doesn't show that the pause happened, but the, I'm assuming the pause is going on. No one's moving, the clock isn't ticking down, so we will wait and see. The there reconnection is. is there. Beautiful. So nothing, nothing's going on, nothing, no restart or anything like that. We do see a lot of pings coming from the red side to kind of go and invade the blue side's blue buff. But we yeah, also think... see the blue side going a lot of pings <laughs> to invade the red side's blue buff. Okay. Do you remember week two when we saw both the junglers simply invade each other, swap sides, and then literally just clear each other's jungles without realizing that they were both doing that? Yes, I, I do remember that one. I'm hoping that this happens again because that was such a funny moment to see. Also, if the UMD Chicken Chasers don't decide to stay and take the blue buff, meanwhile the UMN Pocket Picks take the blue side's blue buff, that's actually going to be very painful for Elise because she is very mana reliant in the early game, so if she doesn't get the blue buff early on, her clear is going to be very slowed down to the point where she will definitely be behind by at least one or two levels when it comes to the first back compared to Revanescence. It's very interesting both teams actually did like a whole rotation around the blue buff to see if anyone was nearby didn't find anyone but oh. like you said at least when it ended up going back to her red buff while kha'zix and malachi oh. are staying oh, at her warding. poppy is looking around and warding oh it was it spotted they, they they are spotted poppy is coming around they know that they're they're doing it. They brought it into the brush so that Poppy can't do anything about it. I'm hoping this alerts Zyx to immediately go into the enemy jungle and take the blue buff for himself. Because as we mentioned, Elise needs it. You actually need a blue buff as Elise early on. And yes, she is going back to take the blue buff for herself. Meanwhile, we do see that both bot lanes are trying to shove up really early. Go for this first level two just because. Both a Nautilus and a Thresh level 2 early on is a massive threat that you have to respect on both sides. So whichever lane is able to hit level 2 first, could potentially go for a trade immediately and go for a kill, especially because both the 80 carries are very immobile. Right, well Elise was able to go ahead and grab the enemy blue buff, and Elise is actually going to go ahead and come down as well. She is level 2, the level 2 fight is going down in the bot lane. Jin is going to go ahead and get grabbed, exhausted, and first blood going over to Vars. Quincy Adams will get it. A lot of damage is going on to the Nautilus. Nautilus actually having to flash away as well. Thresh ended up flashing as well to go ahead and get the play, but did not connect. So yeah. first blood and their blue buff as well going over to the side of blue. And that's actually a very massive lead for Quincy Adams early on. Last time that we saw this happen, it actually paid off very well, especially because it's a Varus who, when we're talking about that trinity of AD carries right now within the meta, I would argue that Varus is one of the most powerful out of all them, just because he has the most spammable long range ability to keep up that poke with the lethality items. Meanwhile, we can see that Revanescence is coming towards the mid lane, looking for a gank. Yeah, we see the Cosmic Storm gonna go ahead and gank the Yasuo. Yasuo taking a lot of damage, having to flash away. Getting close to death, what his flash will save him, so that means Yasuo will have to go back. He does not have teleport. He did end up using his exhaust as well. The exhaust so was back does... in an earlier trade. 
Yes, but still, that means that he does not have his summoners either way. Yeah, the exhaust is already halfway off cooldown, so if he can survive for roughly two more minutes, it should be back up. Meanwhile, the biggest thing to point out is so far the lanes I've been focused on with ganks from both teams are lanes without teleports. So even though it's not necessarily getting a massive objective advantage, you're getting a lot of pressure advantage in the sense that you're denying a lot of farming experience from both sides. Granted, it seems like Quincy Adams decided to back off rather than try and shove away too heavily back in bot lane. And him and Double Seven Varus are still fairly close to each other. They're equal in farm and roughly equal in experience. Well, OXO is kind of hovering around, taking two free tower shots in this top lane just to stop Maokai from backing, which he did. But we do see that Elise is going into those bushes to see if Maokai is going to stay. This is going to be a very interesting gank, as because the top lane is there as well. The flash into the cocoon, and OXO will get the kill. Yeah, meanwhile, Riven is right there. He will be able to catch this wave, which... Should mean that Burning Case won't have to burn his teleport just yet. He can let the wave go completely to Revanescence. The only thing that could be a worry right now is if they try and dive, they are not going for it. That would have been a very risky dive, especially with how low Oloxo is. So that's very smart for them to not go for it. And as we see, Burning Case is saving the teleports and is opting to keep it potentially for using it towards bot lane or even mid lane to pressure a dragon later on or to keep himself alive and healthy if he gets ganked yet again. Alright, we do see the flame playing into the cult onto this Nautilus. Nautilus is taking a lot of damage from Mars, taking a lot of damage as well from the Jin. So a little a little bit of trading going down in the bot lane. Zyre or not Zyre, I'm sorry. Uh Zyrex? Zyrex? I'm at least Zyx. Zyx, thank you. Zyx was going was around the mid lane seeing if he can gank this LeBlanc. LeBlanc was not going to take the bait, and oh, there goes the wind wall. Again. Oh, here's another one. Oh, Yasuo is coming down the, the exhaust, exhaust again, and he's just going to get away with that exhaust. That's so, so unfortunate because at least was there just a little bit ago. If they waited just a little bit, maybe something could have happened. And even LeBlanc is trying their hardest to get that damage. And Varus getting stunned up, a flash with the auto attack, but then he got exhausted. Jin will not be able to get the kill onto Varus, and, he's, and his knowledge is going to pay the price with a lot of damage going onto him. But we do see LeBlanc actually going to go ahead and come down and gank this bot lane. This is going to be very interesting. I can't wait to see the hook going on. The hook also going onto LeBlanc. LeBlanc is going to be a lot of damage onto this. Jin, Jin, oh, sorry, not this Jin, the Thresh, Thresh is going to go down, but Jin is going to go ahead and take out Quincy Adams, and Maokai stopping the poppy back, so many people are low at that bot lane right now, but it is a two for none for red side. Yeah, that's actually very big for the pocket picks, that was a very aggressive four man gank into the bot lane which was actually completely unanswered by league of legends over in the mid lane he just kept on shoving up and farming yes he now has a farm advantage over to chainer but the kill and assist makes it that they're still basically even in fact it puts the chainer roughly 100 gold ahead which 100 gold albeit isn't that much but that's a few pots to me and that means a few pots means more li more light well, she didn't pick up the box. She instead went for a Lost Chapter and a Phoenix Codex, which means that she's going to be going for a very early Morale Namacon. Not necessarily a early Seeker's Arm Guard, which is actually what I was expecting, just because you are against a Yasuo and a Varus, so the early armor could be very helpful. But my imagination is right now thinking that she wants to go for very high damage to try and go for the potential Snowball, rather than going for safety. And the blue team actually ended up getting the Infernal while we were talking about that very sneaky play from the blue side. And that's a lot of damage that's going to go on to the Yasuo. And I like it, but I do want to talk about this again. It was about the ganks. It was about the mids rotating to those other wings that got him that, those two kills that they deserve. And Kha'Zix is here again. The flash hook missing and the... And the flash going off on the Thresh. Thresh is actually gonna have to slow down the curtain call. Going in, missing, missing, and nothing is gonna come out of it. While top lane Poppy is getting 
beaten down by the Maokai, and Yasuo is now down here. Kind of, you know, dashing around, seeing if he can get something. Cocoon will miss onto the Nautilus, and we're going to go ahead and reset a little bit more. So last time we saw the four-man dive from the pocket picks towards Bali, and this time we see it coming from the chicken chasers, and again, we can see the commitment from the opposing side is just opting into shoving into the tower very hard, trying to get some damage off, but not actually really putting a huge threat to the tower just yet. Just because in these early stages of the game, both Yasuo and the Blanc aren't really tower taking threats. Yasuo will be the moment he finishes his first attack speed item or crit item, which I imagine that is going to be a static shiv. Unless if he's going for. I don't know. He has a. It looks like he's going to go in for a zeal. At the very well, least. Crit Yasuo is a thing. He does get a lot of double the crit from his passive, but the crit damage is lower just a little bit. Poppy getting taken down very low. Yasuo is actually going to go ahead and use his ultimate onto the cause of exhausting pop as well. The Kakuba will land onto LeBlanc. LeBlanc having to flash away. She will uh, E away as well, getting out of there so close to death, both of them. And that was a very, very good exchange, a very nice counter game coming from Elise. Yeah, that ended up making a bit of pressure for the mid lane, allowing it to where we could potentially see a dive here from League of Legends if the chainer stays, but it looks like he is opting to back and with the or with this being a teleportless mid lane, unlike we saw from last game, that means that the tower is gonna be under a little bit more pressure. Riven Essence is there to guard it. However, this allows him to know the exact position of the jungler. We could see Zyx try to go for a gank right now, and it'll be completely uncontested. And it looks like that is what he is looking for. And he actually misses spotting the Maokai. No, the Zyx oh, does no. Maokai is going to go ahead and pop the whole combo onto Maokai. Maokai actually being able to get out with a little bit of HP, having to pop the ultimate, and, you know, almost actually getting the kill. And Chichiru will get the kill onto Zyx as well as into the Yasuo, the double kill for LeBlanc. That's scary. That's going to be very good for LeBlanc leading up to the mid to the mid -team. Yeah, and with the Vengeful Maelstrom coming from Burning Case, that is a lot of durability coming from Maokai. He already has a Bombie Cinder. Now we see him back. He's also picking the Chain Vest and some boots. So he will be slightly more mobile, not too much more mobile, but enough to where his roams and income at move speed will be slightly more impactful. But you have to remember, you're not going to burst down a Maokai that easily. It's a Maokai. Yeah, you don't do burst down a Maokai like you said, especially with all that armor that he does have. Yes, at least did a lot of damage being an AP, but was not able to get the kill. And that was the, that was the important part. So with Chichinger now having two, three kills under his belt, it's probably going to be very scary for this Yasuo to lane up against him. And it looks like Elise is going to go ahead and kind of give attention to Chichinger. Chichinger having to go ahead and get out of there. The Chichinger will land and Chichinger is going down in a heartbeat, getting deleted by Elise and Yasuo. It was a very good gang, however, I did not really like seeing the final breath being used at the last second there by League of Le or last breath being used right there by League of Legends. He could have easily saved it. Yes, it is a short cooldown ability, but it is still very impactful that you shouldn't use it unless you have to. Oh, we have two fights going down in both bot and top lane. It does look like Malkai is going to go ahead and get stunned away, and Elise is going to go ahead and get the kill. And at the bot lane, it does look like Nautilus, Quincy Adams will end up dying as well. But Riven Essence actually will clean up the fight in top lane, getting the kill onto Elise. And doing a little bit of damage onto his top lane. Oh, Olivek, so why do you go back in? He's going to go back in. He's going to actually dive. Will not be able to do much damage with her being isolated. The red buff was not enough. She is going to go ahead and back right in front of him, kind of baiting him out, and does end up getting the bait, but has to flash away from this. Oh, oh God, and he lives! Oh, that was a little bit of a BM right there from OloXO. Not a full BM, I'm not going to try and claim that, but backing right in front of an enemy who has half health and is an assassin, while you are very low, only around 300 health, that is way too risky. You should not be going for that. Just because right now you have magic resist builds, not armor. Kha'Zix does attack damage. 
You do not have the right itemization for trying to bait him like that right now, and you really shouldn't try that. Meanwhile, we can see that mid lane is being really risk or being put under threat. Damage up going down the second two, but Poppy is gonna go and pop the teleport coming back into mid lane to defend the Yasuo. So nothing really coming out of it. The teleport was burned though, so that is a teleport away from Poppy. Poppy is coming down into this bot lane as Infernal is up again. And it does look like the blue team is gonna go ahead and try to clear it up a little bit to see if they can get as much vision as possible to get at the second Infernal for them. This ends up being two Infernals for the Chicken Chasers. I don't really see how they could throw the game too heavily. That's going to be plus 16% damage to them. I believe it's I believe it's 8% per stat, right? Uh, like I don't believe so, actually, but it doesn't matter because they do end up getting it for themselves. Riven Essence did actually end up dying with Quincy Adams using his ultimate to kind of lock him down and copy and making sure her steadfast presence was on him so that he couldn't jump away. They are going to go ahead and do a lot of pressure onto this bot lane so that they can get this tower gold, but that does not mean that they're that the, side of, the red side is not going to give it up without a fight. Yeah, can go just right onto Man Slice. Oh, Nautilus is actually going down so close. Malachi having to pop his ultimate. Maelstrom is gonna save him. Poppy almost dying as well. LeBlanc popping her ultimate, making them think that that was the real one, but she is half HP. And, Ma and Nautilus taking so much damage, almost dying there. And it was very scary to see that happen. But it is. Riven Essence again with the Jin. Jin is gonna get caught by the hook and die in a heartbeat. Zero zero seven. Horus is gone, deleted, and that's another kill going to Blue Team as well as first current gold. That is a lot of pressure that's gonna be announced to them now. We can see that the total gold difference between two teams is roughly three thousand. The biggest difference between any two lanes right now is the top lane being. 1,100 gold, roughly a bomb cinder worth, which actually right now, I'm, actually, I'm still surprised we haven't seen all so pick up one yet. It is very powerful in terms of... Oh, never oh mind. my god, the damage going onto the Elise and the Nautilus ultimate gonna pick it up, as well as Riven Essence taking the... or killing Olo X... Olo, sorry. And as well, that's two kills going over to Red Side. For just because they wanted to get a ward, I, I yeah. guess we do see I... mid lane the blue side or sorry red turret in mid lane is going to go down to just minions, so that's more gold in the pocket. Yasuo is it. back in this mid lane to kind of defend it, but Probably. he's really not going to do much. Varus is coming up to the top lane to make sure that blue t uh, red team doesn't get a turret of their own doing a lot of damage oh. actually the Varus ultimate is going to go ahead and pop onto the malachi malachi having to pop this ultimate going onto the Varus himself doing a little bit of damage trying to actually getting him pretty close pretty close to death yeah but there are four members right up top lane well they don't know that just yet malachi is going to go ahead and start getting his chin and nala's will actually show themselves and they are going to go ahead and try to get this turret it is Vars at half HP and the Thresh, you know, practically full. Oh, and sorry, the, the max range hook off from <laughs> Nautilus will end up hitting Vars and Quincy uh, Riven Essence will die to Quincy. Will die. Oh, sorry, Quincy Adams will die to Riven Essence. And that's another kill for Kha'Zix. That's kind of scary with Malphite actually getting hit with the Cthulhu and with the Thresh hook. Elise is going to go down as well to Riven Essence. Riven Essence, another kill, just trying to get this Thresh with the red buff and everything. Uh, hook onto him, he's going to have to flash away the, the Thresh away! <laughs> out of mid air and was able to take the last tower shot to get the kill as well. Yasuo, so close, getting CC to death, literally, as Manslice will take the kill onto Yasuo. And wow, that Thresh play, getting him the kill. Hill was golden. I don't even know what to say after all this aggression. There's been so much happening. What am I even supposed to talk about? How am I supposed to be able to say, like, what is good, what is bad from these things when there's just too much information going on? 
Honestly, the best thing I could say right there is the fact that back with the pick we saw from Man Slice onto Quincy Adams, if it weren't for Gavin making that flash attempt to dodge it, Quincy Adams wouldn't have gotten hit by the hook. It would have been Gavin, which, I mean, in the end, also allowed for Burning Case and Rivenescence to die off as well, so I don't really know whether or not to say it was all worth, because I have no idea how it all would have played out in the end. It, it was so much for so long. Well, I will say this, Kha'Zix now having 5, 2, and 3 as his score right now, picking up, sorry, his Skirmishing Shaper with a Warrior and a Ghost build as well. He's picking up the pickaxe, maybe going for that edge of night. I mean, that's a lot of damage from the Kha'Zix. Kha'Zix being able to practically kill a lot of people if he gets any one of them isolated. Elise is, you know, is going a little bit more tanky with the Giant Skull and the Chain Vest in her in her inventory, but it's very, it's very scary to see if this Kha'Zix continues to gain those kills, it's probably gonna be him, you know, him and LeBlanc, you know, ending this game for Red, Red Team. Yeah, and as you mentioned, with the Ezra being picked up onto Riven Essence real soon, that's actually gonna give him a lot more team fight presence, just because as we mentioned before, the biggest threat to Kha'Zix right now is going to be the subpass presence from OLOXO, which, if the Edge of Knight is there to prevent the Sunpass Presence hitting Kha'Zix, that means he'll be able to get a free jump in without any threat of being knocked back. Alright, well we do see a pincer move going on right now with a team fight starting up. The ball is getting taken down really, really low, but Yasuo is going to get taken down as well. Jin having to flash away, and Riven Essence will die to the Elise. And this looks like Yasuo. Yasuo is going to go in. League of Legends killing off 077 Varus. Varus himself actually <laughs> landing that beautiful Q, getting Chichinger and saying, No, you're going to die here, Chichinger. Or oh, sorry, Maokai trying his hardest. He will end up flashing over the wall and will end up getting away. So a zero for three on for blue team right there. And they will pick up the Mountain Drake. And this is going to be two Infernal plus a Mountain Dragon in each. This means that there's going to be a lot of flat out AD and AP added on to everyone from the side of the chicken chasers, but it also means that whenever they go for an objective such as Tower or Baron, they're going to be melting that insanely fast. Just imagine a Yasuo, Varus, and Elise onto a Baron. That thing is not going to last too long. Yeah, well, the blue team did end up picking up the mid turret as his mid tier uh, 2 turret as well with that dragon so like you're saying any objectives that blue team does go for they're gonna melt it really quick i do want to see some sort of baron play coming up in the near i want to say maybe two to three minutes we, we will have to wait and see but this game remember is not only about objective it is about team play and right now kha'zix leblanc Jin not having that high of a kill count but he does have a decent amount of cs i feel like that team the next team fight will probably decide what's going to happen for the rest of this game yeah no the next team fight is going to be massive especially because we can see both teams are grouping out more five than five right now the only team that i think could go with some form of split pushing is going to be the pocket basers because they have burning case with the teleport up meanwhile oloxo does not have his teleport up he cannot match his split pushing as well because he won't be able to return. However, if he stays in here, he could deny the teleport completely from Burning Case by getting a little bit of power control on him. Although it actually looks like they're looking towards pushing bot lane, which if too many people show bot lane, the Pogpix could melt, or not melt, they could try and rush the Baron, which it looks like that's what they're wanting to do. They're not even getting spotted. No, they aren't getting spotted. There is a ward in that brush that they just Worded right now because you do see that they are coming up they are in that barrier pit all the words being popped in there to make sure that they are not doing it so they are taking a little bit of damage from that baron and they will have to back away from this but that does leave the blue side to freely freely just roam into that mid and most likely get that in hit turret yeah i feel like if the pocket picks wants to try and go for the bait such as that they should have actually gone onto the Baron to force some retaliation rather than to simply ward it and seeing it's not being done. Plus, it took quite a while for the Chicken Chasers to actually arrive to the Baron and ward it up, which means that they probably would have had enough time to take it themselves. Alright, we do see a massive wolf coming on, so there is not going to be that much damage coming 
going onto the inhib turret, but a lot of poke is happening with Varus and Yasuo being able to have that wind wall will be able to just kind of negate any retaliation from this, from red side as well. And it yeah. seems like they're trying to trying to set up, trying to see what's going to happen. Yet again, Varus landing those cues. It, that it does hurt. It, landing on the Maokai, not so much, but we will see what happens. Nautilus will try to hook onto Yasuo. Yasuo will win the Cocoon onto Nautilus, and Nautilus is going down. That's a good vibe, man. That's like, Yasuo is actually going to go ahead and get the two-man knockoff as well. LeBlanc going down. Maokai is going to go down as well. Riminescence is going in the back line. Yasuo will get the double kill, but Riminescence will get the kill onto Yasuo, getting exhausted on the way, but double kill going onto Juarez, and that is an ace just for Yasuo. 4v5. That was 4v5. Yep. Just going to put it out there. That was 4v5. They won the fight, they got an ace, they're taking the mid inhibitor right now, they can easily rotate over to the top lane and get the second tier turret, which is going to be a lot of extra gold into their pockets, they are already 6k ahead, getting that extra top tier turret is just going to be even more, especially if they can all gather there and get the local gold together, plus, with the amount of people that they still have up, they can easily go for another pick if someone from the side of the pocket picks try to defend and get a little overextended, but it looks like the chicken chasers want to back off. Yeah, chicken chasers are going to go ahead back and buy. They actually did get spotted out with the lane. Varus. And Varus is going to go ahead and land the curtain call. Landing three, four, all four shots. One onto the Varus and three onto the Thresh. But they are going to go ahead and just back away freely with no, no chase from the pocket picks. Yeah, and... There are two things I want to get a quick idea on what your perspective is right now. If we have time, it looks like they're hovering around Baron, and there is a fight breaking. Oh uh, no, not fully breaking out. Just oh man, up. slice your ball. You're by yourself again. You can't be doing that. No. We saw what happened last time. He got deleted. He is a support Nautilus, not a top lane Nautilus. You're not nearly as tanky as you think you are. You have to remember that. And now that we seem to have some breathing room, I don't know, this game has been very aggressive, but what do you think about the way that this roster change affected the Chicken Chasers? For what it seems, both Chicken Chasers and Dad's roster changes seem to really work out for them. They are showing up very heavily in this week's games, and the overall performance between these teams is just mind-blowing. Honestly, if you couldn't tell me that there was a roster change, I thought that they were still just working phenomenally like they normally do. So, like you said, it works it worked well for them. They're doing really good. But this game is still not over yet. There is the next dragon coming up in 10 seconds, and it is going to be an ocean. So we will see there is a little huddle all around. That river bush Nautilus is trying to get up, trying to put some wards in there. But it does look like they're gonna try and see what they can do. Poppy, however, is in that top lane, getting all the damage into the in-hit turret, and they're gonna have to back away while at least will solo dragon by herself. And Poppy looks like she's gonna try her hardest to get this tower. She will miss her ultimate, and Kha'Zix Riven Essence will be there by her. being able to try to get some damage. It looks like the, there was a team fight as well in the bot lane, and Dawson will both end up getting two picks for himself. Gavin will end up giving Riminescence, and it looks like Maokai is trying his hardest to get out. And they will get stunned up against the wall with the hook and the play, and another kill going over to Gavin. That's an ace again, and it looks like they're going to try to just end this game. That was a really impressive fight in the bot lane, as well as the pick onto Manslash right outside the Dragon Pit. It was just, there was three fights going on throughout the map all at the same time. You just have Elisa and the Dragon, with Mantis getting called out, he's now being called out again. No, he's he's no. gonna live, and that's gonna be he's being called out right there. And that is game again. Chicken Chasers will pick up the victory. All right, and that's gonna be game number two for tonight. As we mentioned, just I think it was only thirty seconds ago, how both UMD teams with their roster changes are showing up far more positively than one would expect after a massive roster change as we had seen. I'm not too sure if the players are just more comfortable with the teammates that they're currently playing with, 
or if they have previous experience and we just simply don't know about it. But I don't know about you, Dreamer. I am really impressed by these teams. Oh, they both UM, uh, UMD teams have shown what they can do even with different players on their teams, but it doesn't matter. They've worked. They got Both of them got the victory. Both of them are going up into that standings. If you want to go and look at that damage dealt graph, amazing. Varus, even though you know he is a poking champion, he will poke, 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 doing the most out of everyone. Rivenescence getting a lot of that damage for his team as well, going six five and three yes he did end up dying a lot you know at the, towards the end of the game but those early game kills did get him a decent you know a decent advantage in that mid game but it was Yasuo it was Elise it was Poppy that were able to do so much being able to stun and stop I really am going to actually give this MVP I was going to give it to Yasuo but I'm going to go and give it to the Elise and the reason why is Elise was everywhere at least landing those cocoons landing those that cc being able to get anyone that came close to poppy came close to yasuo i'm really going to give it to at least for getting her team started and giving them the win and i'll agree with you on that and some of the biggest key moments we can remember is going to be that early dive top lane against burning case on the maokai which end up being able to give poppy enough or low xo enough of a lead in the early game to kind of solo carry his own lane with riven or rosaix only having to ever come back up whenever there's another 2v2 happening between riven essence burning case and low xo which always came out in the favor of the chicken chasers the only time that there was a bit of a lack of showing from zyx was going to be in terms of how fast he showed up to the bot lane during that four-man dive. However, he survived, he held the lane, he made sure that turret didn't go down, so even though he was late, he still did the job he had to do once he arrived. You're absolutely right. Well, that is going to be the second game for today. We, When we come back, it will be McAllister versus St. Olaf for our last game of the night. So stick around, and we will be back shortly.
All right, and we are back for game number three. It's going to be Macaustar versus St. Olaf finishing off the Knights for game number three. Dreamer, what do you think is going to be happening for this game? I am kind of interested to see how things are going to play out since these two teams are, again, in a similar standing as to what we saw in the last game. Well, if I remember correctly, St. Olaf is just one uh, win ahead of McAllister. So, yet. Yeah. I feel like that's how it has been this entire time. It's just that one win team. But we have been seeing a lot of those underdog teams just winning today. We saw, um, what was it? You and Dad picking up the win. Chicken Chasers didn't really pick up the win this time, but they definitely put up a fight. So I will give them that as Pocket Picks are now 3-2. and two. So I'm kind of wanting to see another 3-2 and two team coming over and that being... Uh, McAllister. Yeah, if it ends up being McAllister winning, then we will see another even matchup like we saw in game one to where the teams will go into even brackets. And we still need to see some more of these teams get split up within their standings because right now there are still a lot of ties. We see a tie for first place. We see a tie for second, tie for third. Like everything is tied right now until we get further into the weeks. And it's just going to be a little bit nicer to get a little more definitive standings between these teams. One thing I'm curious is whether or not Varus will actually make it through the bands this time. Because for games one and two, we saw him being a powerhouse in both games. Varus, yet again, has been picked a band this entire like I don't even know I won't, won't even say this entire because week one wasn't that way it was really about a Camille Camille was picked or banned for week one and two but once Ver once Camille got that nerf it was about various it was about like we don't want that poking champion in our lane we don't want that poking champion to we don't want to fight against that poking champion so I yet again I'm waiting to see either him getting picked or banned again. And it's mostly been the blue team that has taken him away from the red side. So red side is either going to have to pick or have to ban him away or blue is most likely going to pick him. Yeah, and the only champion we've seen so far for today be pick ban was Kha'Zix, which I'm wondering if that trend will keep up as well. I doubt it because we did see that the one game Kha'Zix got in, he didn't really have too strong of the showing the later the game went on. Yes, he was very impactful in the early game, but he was able to get easily shut down in the late game. Well, we will have to see how the bot lane will work. It was about a lot. It was really about the ganks. It was really about the jungler showing their presence, making the Varus kind of just known. So if anything happens, I really am expecting. What I really honestly want to see is kind of something away from the rock, paper, scissors of the AD carries right now, which being, yet again, if you are just joining us, Ash, Jin, Varus, I'm wanting to see someone else. Caitlyn is another safe pick, as well as I've been seeing a lot of Lucian being picked up as well to get rid of those, uh, to get rid of that early game, you know, kind of stally. No, I want to say nonsense for a lack of a better term in that bot lane where VAR or where Lucian will kind of just go up in your face and kind of dominate and tell you who is the boss of that lane. So I do want to see a Lucian, you know, kind of poke his head out a little bit and see where he, you know, comes up in this meta. Yeah, Lucian's a very good pick in the early game, as you were saying, especially against these Poké VAD carries, because he can all in, and the only way to really retaliate would be to blow their crowd control on him, which, by the time they have the ability to do that, they're most likely already chunked or dead. And another champion I would like to see, similar to Lucian's early game aggressive playstyle, would be Draven. The big well, ego head himself. Draven did get a few buffs within the last couple patches, but those buffs were not, from what I understand, not big enough for him to come back into the meta. Yes, he is able to deal a little bit more damage with his Q, as well as, I believe, his ultimate did end up doing a little bit more damage as well, but it wasn't enough just because you. it's all about having to play a, like, a little mini game with him. It's about catching your axes. It's about getting that those stacks of your ultimate to make sure that you can, you know, get more money 
in that early game so you can dominate the mid game and even end it at that point. So we, I wouldn't mind seeing a Draven, but I don't think he's going to be as uh, likely to be picked for today. That's a fair point. The main thing that I was thinking for why Draven could get picked is just because within the last patch, I'm not too sure why, but he had a bit of a spike in pick rates within solo queues. So I was figuring maybe he may get seen within the competitive scene soon. Not too sure. As you mentioned, he is very gimmicky with his passive, especially having to catch the axes over and over again. But either way, as we've seen before... Nothing is really definitive until the game is over. So we have to wait for champion select, and then we have to wait for the game itself to see how things will play out. You're yeah. absolutely right. So what I want to definitely talk about is how do you think, or who do you think is going to be that main top laner for this team? For either one of these teams, we've seen Poppy in both games. One pop, the first game wasn't really as a good performance for Poppy. The second game, though, was a great and dominant performance. Yet, maybe not in that early game, but in the later game, was able to stun, was able to get those CC, the jump or denial of jumps and everything. So, I really want to see who is going to get picked for this top laner again. But we are in chain or we are in pick ban, so we're going to go ahead and see a Lux being taken away and i don't i i feel like that's definitely a targeted ban yeah i doubt that's a right. ban because of meta or anything like that it's definitely a targeted ban most likely against the defiled who knows maybe wolfie meister is a pocket like luck support that. player we may not know right. either well, way we're seeing a lot of targeted bans on defiled right now cassiopeia as well Are you certain? and it looks like leblanc is going to get taken away from no boots and kozik is going to get taken away from hear me roar now yet yeah. again the kozik is back. the kind of typical ban so that's not really a targeted ban but jace that might be another targeted ban. I feel like very a lot of hate is going on to the champion the pools line. of St. Olaf. Which, in all admittance, I think that has been the better banning strategy. Most of the times that we've been seeing the teams, at least for today, banning in the targeted style rather than in a meta ban style, they're usually the ones that come out on top because they get rid of who the people are strong with. And we see a Rex I picked up for Hear Me Roar. All right, the instant wreck side, the gin in the <laughs> war way coming right back at it with those instant pickups. So interesting, like Varus is not banned, and yet we see the gin getting picked up. They're like, nope, no, nah, we don't care about the Varus. We're all right with this gin. But Warwick, that's a good pickup right there, especially with the CC lock that he has and being able to fear and suppress and be. I mean, he doesn't ever have to worry about going back. He can like jung inf jungle infinitely, to be honest with you. So I, I definitely like that pickup. But we see a Jinx getting hovered. That's with Vers uh, up. I really? actually like that. I'm really excited to see if that actually gets locked in because we do yeah. see the Thresh being also hovered for the and bot lane. And in all minutes, it's been a very long time since I've seen it. It is locked in. All right, the Jinx and the Thresh going for the bot lane of McAllister. Okay, so that's a Jinx. The AD carry. That... I, how long has it been since Jinx has really been anywhere seen in competitive? Um, you're, uh, you're gonna, I'm going to have to take a rain check on that one. We'll have to do our research for that. But I like it because that means that they're going to try to go for that mid to late game you know, comp with the Jinx, because Jinx is a very, very big hyper carry. But we see a Zyra and a Renekton getting picked up for St. Olaf as well. So I I'm really wondering if that's going to be a tank Renekton or an actually full damage Renekton. I imagine it may be a Bruiser Renekton. We may see a Black Cleaver since it did have the recent changes, making it a lot more beefier. Which I feel like Renekton would like more than the heavy damage Black Cleaver that used to be there. All right. Well, it we did see the Shen and now the Trundle being hovered over for the top laner of McAllister. Kind of interesting to see if it is going to be that Trundle. Trundle does do a, you know a decent 
or does have a decent time with the Renekton being able to take away his AD with his Chomp and be able to take away his health with his ultimate as well. Syndra and Trundle will be picked up for the last members of McAllister. Yeah, and I actually feel like the Trundle pickup right there defines the way that this Renekton is going to have to play because if he wants to go for the tanky build, he will not be able to dual Trundle because as you mentioned, Trundle can just strip away his damage and his resistances. Instead, you're probably going to have to go for more of a sustained fighting style with Renekton, so maybe something like a Ravenous Hydra or a Titanic Hydra earlier on. Something that could potentially burst the Trundle before he has time to retaliate. Well, we will see what will happen in that top lane a little bit later on. I do like the fact that they have a Rek'Sai, they have the Trundle, they have the Thresh. That's in three tanks right there. The Jinx being that hyper carry and the Syndra pressing R to win. I, I do like this a lot, but it is going to be with the seven seconds left. Diana, the last member of St. Olaf. So that's a Diana mid. I'm assuming as yes, it is going to be a Diana mid for Defiled. So Trundle versus Renekton, Warwick versus Rek'Sai, Syndra versus Diana, and Jin and Zyra versus Jinx and Thresh. Okay, I'm not... Honestly, this is the most diverse pick Ben that we've seen in quite a while. I'm very happy with it, don't get me wrong. I am really happy to see diversity, but I'm not sure what to really make of this. The best thing I could say is going by 1v1 matchups, which typically, not going to say always, typically a Renekton should lose to a Trundle because Trundle has that giant 1v1 potential. However, we could always see Jungle Pressure come in from the Flube early in the top lane, which puts Renekton ahead. And then he could easily snowball, especially if he goes for a very aggressive playstyle. Syndra versus Diana. I want to say Syndra should win just because she has the range advantage. But a level 6 Diana is always threatening, especially if she can get some early kills through roams. And yeah. it's... If you also have to remember, I'm sorry, you also have to remember that Syndra is a ranged carry and Diana is not. Diana's going to have to take a lot of aggression from both Syndra being able to pop her Dark Spheres and just auto attack her. It's going to be very hard for Diana to even try and roam when she's going to have to use a lot of her mana just to wave clear the lane. Yeah, that's very true. Unless if she can kind of set up her passive really well to get the AoE auto attacks in accordance with the backline minions. But I feel like that those opportunities aren't going to come up too much because, as you mentioned, Syndra can easily poke her out. Now, we do have the official lock-in set. So we see that right now the Faker is going Ignite with Renekton. and he's going to be lacking in teleports to match up any form of split pushing from Trundle. However, as we mentioned, the only way for Renekton to really win this lane is through early aggression, which Ignite is going to really help out with that. We'll see the Ignites on Diana, making it so that she could potentially all in right at level 6 or even earlier if No Boots ever steps past his boundaries. But No Boots is also carrying the exhaust, meaning that the all-in potential from Diana is going to be very much weakened and will probably need a gank from Deflube in order to finish off the kill. Well, Deflube is going to go ahead and pick up a Ghost, which will work immensely well with his ultimate, but it does look like everyone else kind of has the normal summoner spells. But I feel, yet again, it's going to have to be for these junglers to really set the tone of this game. Junglers were going to have to, like, that top lane, that mid lane, even that bot lane. The mid lane, if they, if Rek'Sai is able to get Syndra started, that Diana's going to have a very terrible time, as well as Syndra being able to do a lot of damage very early in that game. But the flu, if he gets that Renekton going, it's going to be very hard for Trundle to come back as well. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. Instead of the junglers, so I feel like the overall gank pressure of these junglers isn't too strong early game. I feel like Rek'Sai is much better when it comes to objective control just because you have the Tremor Sense. Warwick is very good once he has his ultimate. Yes, he does have the early gank potential now because of his Howl, but it's not that great of an ability just because you have to really get behind them for it to be too useful. Otherwise, you're just making them run away from your allies. So... Personally, I feel like more of the pressure is going to be on these top laners, just because, as we see, it is the TP versus the Ignite, and it is two very heavy bruisers and duelists that could potentially snowball out of control. 
Well, we will have to see who will snowball out of control first because you do have to remember even though jinx is a hyper carry if she snowballs out of control this game might not even go into the late game with jinx being able to do a lot of damage early that is very true jinx is one of those hyper carries who once she does snowball is very hard to control just because of the aoe damage of her rockets and her affinity for crit builds which we haven't really seen a crit build from a single ad carry in quite some time I imagine she will be going that, but who knows? We may see a full lethality jinx. That is a possibility. I mean, everyone's doing it. Why not jump on the bandwagon? I definitely expect to see an edge of night for sure onto the jinx. Even though, like, yes, we do see the mostly crit builds on her, edge of night is still really good, especially being... You know, being able to block up the Warwick ultimate, being able to get away from Diana, even the, um, even the Zyra being, being able to get rid of that snare, I don't see why she would not pick up a bit up an edge of night. I would normally agree with you, but I feel like it's too high of a cost to really want to go for that big of a sink, in terms of gold when you could go for a simply higher damage and let someone say Thresh heal for you. And I feel like the fact that as long as Formic Nightfall just saves his flame for Warwick, he could easily stop the engage potential right there. Well, that's also saying that Warwick does get through that front line to get to that back line. So we will kind of have to see what happens there. Hopefully, it, the, all the tanks will be able to get, you know, in their face. Hopefully, Thresh will be able to peel for the carries. But only time will tell. Yeah, and as we've seen before, time and time again, use your predictions actually give us a bit of a curse. So I don't really want to say this time around who I think is going to win or who I think is going to lose. Just because I don't want to give over the caster's curse to one of these teams. Well, I mean, we can do this and I'm going to do it anyways. I'm still going to go ahead and give it to blue team just because i want that jinx to go ahead and snowball they have the tanky comp they have they have the ability to peel they have the ability to you know shut down a lot of those ad carries with the trundle with the rex side being able to stun and snare and well it's not snare but knock up and everything i don't i am going to go ahead and give it over to McAllister. Fine, I'll join you, and I would have said McAllister as well. I'm not going to try and go against you just to keep up with that little habit of ours. Just because I really like the team composition. And honestly, this is going to be a little biased. Jinx is my favorite AD carry out of all of them. Just because I like the idea of a hyperscaling AD carry like Jinx. Plus, her minigun is so satisfying to use. I'm not sure if you're a big Jinx player. I know you're a Jin player, so you're probably more biased towards Jin. But I just, I love Jinx's minigun. It feels satisfying. Now, we do see that there is going to be a bit of a full clear coming from Rek'Sai. And meanwhile, the Flip is going over for a quick clear style, ignoring the Grob going straight from blue to Wolves, most likely going to red buff. And then, not sure if it's going to be a continued full clear, or if it's going to be a gank attempt. If he wants to go for a gank, then right now it's going to be a little hard for him, seeing as right now Baker is pushing in quite hard. And it's very hard to gank a mid lane early on, especially as Warwick. And also, you have to remember, no boots is playing on Syndra, who can easily just walk away. Yeah, you do have to remember uh, that no boots... What? Go ahead. Did you just see the execute? I did not see the execute. You hear me, Roar just got executed at Raptors. Ooh, very unfortunate. Going for Raptors right after getting that red buff. I understand like a lot of teams will for a lot of people that do have that weak clear will try to go for it, but Raptors still hurt a lot. Like it's yeah. very unfortunate to see that. I was not expecting that, and actually, he got to see that the execute happened, and he is now trying to contest the blue buff. They're going to be finding each other. Whether- uh, okay. Defloop wins the smite war. Simple as that. Oh, my. Yeah. 
time, but we do see a little bit of actually going on the bot lane right now. Zyra is actually going to go ahead and die to the flesh. First blood is going over to blue side. I All did right. not actually see the full on engage as I was looking at top lane, but that is very helpful. That means that Jin will have to be kind of careful in playing against this rush right now. And for what you missed, all that actually was was just Formic Nightfall walking up, playing Wolfie Meister, and then hooking him. That was literally all it was, so it wasn't anything too fancy. There was a flash used from both of them in order to keep up the follow-up when Wolfie Meister flashed away. But I'd say that was really the biggest thing that we missed. Alright, well, yet again, I'm gonna go ahead and bring attention to this mid lane. The ghost actually gonna be popped. On, but from the war we do a lot of damage to the Rek'Sai, Rek'Sai ha is gonna be feared away. Cinder doesn't have any mana right now to kind of do much in the top of the ocean, using a lot of it to kind of help out Diana. Diana did end up using a lot of her pots to get back uh, to that amount of health, and oh, that's top lane getting chomped. Renekton losing a lot of AD, but the trade did end up kind of even for both teams. And yeah, Warwick is actually oh. trying his hardest to do something. He is going to get hit by the pillar. Oh. The attack would have done it, not getting the last hit. Very unfortunate. And we, I don't think Warwick's going to try that again anytime soon. I feel like uh, Squid could have tried to go for a flash auto there to finish off the floop. I'm not sure if he would have had enough damage to do it, but I feel like it would have just barely. Although we did see that right now Faker had the stun ready to go down onto Squid, so it would have been risky. It really is an up in the air thing. Playing safe is, as we mentioned before in the previous game, always better. And we've seen that the team that usually plays safe is the one that comes out on top. Meanwhile, we can see that Hemi Roar is hovering towards the bot lane. It looks like they're going to let the side of St. Olaf push up a bit and then come in for a gank. Yeah, it does look like that. Actually, Just Zyra kind of did end up putting a seed in there, so they do know that Rek'Sai is down there. We do see Renekton going in onto the Trundle, doing a lot of damage. Actually, Renekton popping his ultimate to see if he can get the kill, and he might end up diving as we speak. In just a moment, he is kind of pushing around, seeing if he can do anything, but the mains are taking a lot, and he is going to take a odd or a turret shot but it will not matter. Alright, so nothing is really coming up from this. Any of these aggression types so far, the only thing we actually saw come out really successful was the aggression on the side of the bot lane. Actually, and again, the hook lands! Oh, and the, and the chompers are going down as well, but... She, or, sorry, Jinx is gonna take a lot of damage from the plants. So, even though the engage from the next car from Thresh, was initiated, nothing could really happen because the players were doing so much damage to the Jinx. And we do see actually both mid and jungle coming down to this bot side, but saying, no, we can't really do much. We're not going to tower dive. We're going to end. Yeah, meanwhile, we can see that there's going to be a hover towards the dragon right now from Warwick and Diana. They're actually just going for blue buff. My mistake on that thing that they're going for Dragon, it is a little early and risky since we just saw the Gimme War towards the bot side as well. Right now, most lanes are quite around the equal side. We can see that Defile is mostly going for an Abyssal Scepter early on to try and add to the trade potential. And who knows, maybe we'll see another execute from Human War right here. He is trying to go on to the Raptors. Now, nah, round two, he's got this. I believe you hear me, Roar. You can do it. Take care <laughs> of those guys. Come on. Ah, uh, he's, and... he's good to go. But we oh, just no, that. no! Oh, no, he's good. He's okay, good. okay, okay. I was right. slightly worried for a second. I was like, wait. Nah, so we do see Diana now picking up the blue club. She is going to be able to poke the Cinder out a lot because Cinder, even though she does have the damage, with damage comes very big mana costs. So we will see what happens. The rush is in this mid lane right now, missing the hook, so she does know that she is there. Getting, she is going to go ahead and get played and go onto the Syndra, but getting exhausted at the same time. The Ignite going onto Syndra. 
and she is going to go ahead and flash, but Warwick is there as well. He does have this ultimate ready and waiting. He, I'm expecting it to happen. There it is, the ultimate going down onto Cinder. Cinder coming down so close. The hook missing as well. The play going onto the Diana. Diana is going to get actually oh. killed by the super mega death rocket from the bot lane. I didn't see that coming in, to be honest. I didn't see that coming in either, but the curtain called onto the gym right now. Trying to get rid of that Jinx saying, you killed my mid, I'm gonna kill you. Well, I mean, Jin does the death as a fine art. It's anything, he's just adding to the painting right now. And he's going for this tower. Uh, maybe a dive? He does dive. He is gonna get away with that heal. And right. that was another kill going, or the first kill actually, sorry, going over to Red Team. But that was both Psalms going down as well. Meanwhile, there is another game coming top lane from Himmy Roar. Flash is going to be burned by right out of Faker. Oh, right. Yeah, Faker does not have his Flash now, but he is going to go ahead and go in. Doing, you know, he still has the ultimate on. Trundle is going to have to Flash away. He it does get ignited, but Renekton is going to be met with Rek'Sai. But Warwick is up here again, getting... Waiting for the fear. Fear is gonna go onto the Rexide. Rexide is gonna go ahead and burrow out of there. This Warwick is everywhere today. Well, you have to remember the most times that Warwick appears is when people are low, which he gets a massive burst movement speed. We saw that Trundle was only at about 5% HP, which that means that Warwick gets movement speed bonus tripled, which early on in the game, that is gonna seem like a lot. That is, you're very right, especially having a ghost as well. That's a scary thing to see a roll just coming and running through your face. Oh no, yeah. okay, I was gonna say. <laughs> okay. Sandra almost messed that up for herself, but she does end up getting the blue buff as well. But Diana is actually rotating down to the bot lane, but she is gonna go ahead and get seen by a ward. Yeah, she's that doesn't... Right around the dragon, looks like she just took out a pink. Yeah, it. But we do see Rek'Sai and Syndra kind of scoping out, kind of roaming around there. She is going to go ahead and get knocked up, waiting to go onto the Syndra once again, and is going to go ahead and flash away. All right, she decided to go for the quick trade and back out, which she did have to burn the flash. It was a little bit of a downfall. Meanwhile, it's already getting hooked. Oh, a lot of damage going onto the Zyra. Zyra is actually going to... Maybe Liv, she's popular potion, she has one more auto attack in her, but the plant is doing so much damage and will get the kill. Zyra's gonna take down the Thrash, but Re uh, Rexa is coming down here and she's trying to get this Jin, but Jin doing so much damage. Warwick's down here now, Warwick is gonna not take the kill. He's actually gonna go ahead and take the Jinx. Jinx being so close for Warwick to go ahead and just jump on her and secure that kill. Three for none in the end. And that's also gonna be first blood tower. There are three members down in that bottling. There is no way that they're not gonna get this tower. They could potentially go for a dragon right after. However, they are kind of low, so it may be safer to just back. But if they have Warwick tank the dragon, you have to remember Warwick has an insane amount to sustain. Especially so? when he's low HP as well. And we do have Zyra having her plans to do a little bit of tanking too, if Warwick is does or does get a little bit lower, a little bit unsafe. Meanwhile, we can see that Mikhailstar is coming up to check on the dragon. A ward was put down, however, they are just a little too late. A little bit too late, you're absolutely right. An ocean going over to the red side. Wow, a lot of damage is going on to this Renekton. Renekton popping his ultimate trundle says, Hey, I'm gonna smack you a few times with my club and then just walk away. Yeah, and right now we can see that now that Trundle is level 9, he has the maxed out chomp, he has his ultimate. It's going to be very hard for right now to Faker to ever try and trade with him without Ignite. He will need that up, and most likely he'll also need his ultimate up at the same time if he wants to go for any full-on engages onto this Trundle. Alright, so I do want to go ahead and look at the items really quick. Diana trying to go for that Abyssal Scepter while Cinder is going for that Merlinomicon. As I speak, she just did finish it. Trundle is kind of going. It looks like for an Ice Point Gauntlet. Actually, he's oh, taking a lot top. of damage from the Renekton. Renekton will take a tower shot. And there's the Blood Set. Warwick is coming in, but Rek'Sai <laughs> is over there as well. So we will see the jugglers kind of seeing each other. 
I just love seeing how fast that Warwick runs. Oh, Warwick popping his ultimate right there. He will actually get knocked up by the flash from, from Rek'Sai, but it will not be enough. He's at, taking the tower, trying to get away, and it's very close. But we too do see another Super Mega Death Bucket hitting the right nut of Faker, and he will go down as well as Syndra will take the double kill onto the Warwick. So that's two kills for the Syndra while three members of the red side is going over to mid and trying to take it out but jinx is by herself and she might get dived on just in a moment while her call is getting shot by the outside of the gym and the fourth auto will not hit it's very close but no cigar yeah now they do get some damage onto this tower not enough to really take it down and by pressuring the Jinx off for taking him down really low, she will be forced to back real soon, unless she wants to try and sustain herself back up. I actually miss seeing whether or not she had Fervor Battle or Warlord's Bloodlust. I imagine, with the recent changes to this patch, that Fervor Battle is far more favorable now, because they just simply nerfed the direct amount of healing that Warlord's Bloodlust did. Go ahead. You see that three members of red side is still over here they are going to try to do all of this they do get the hook onto the zyrus red side is going in as well and trundle's there as well trundle will get the kill onto the Jin, and diana is trying her hardest diana gets the kill onto fresh trundle is flashing over to the to the zyra zyra is going to go ahead and die and actually diana does get up get a double kill trundle's trying to get the triple he doesn't get it because jinx will secure the kill and the last but not least Warwick is gonna go ahead and pop his ultimate, trying to get as much damage as he can on the Trundle, but will not get the kill. Two kills going to Jinx, two kills going to Trundle, and that was a four for one, or four for two, sorry, exchange. And a tower. Tower on both sides, because we also have Bright Note Faker taking the tower up top, and now the tower's about to go down mid as well. Granted, that was definitely a far more favorable fight on the side of McAllister because they got more kills and I would argue that getting the mid lane tower is far more favorable than a side lane. Not sure if you would agree with me right there. Nope, well, nope, it's it's perfectly like the tower for tower, yes that does work, but it was the four kills in the end that did help out Mix Alistair more than anything. Especially getting two of those kills onto that hyper carry Jinx. Now and especially since she just picked up her Runon's Hurricane and a BF Sword, so she is going to be doing a little bit more damage and a lot of AoE with those rockets. Yeah, and as you were mentioning with items such as Jinx's Runon's Hurricane, we also have the Abyssal Scepter being finished on Defiled now, and surprisingly, this is the first game in a while that we have seen a Jin without any lethality. He has Essence Reaver, and actually builds for the Berserker's Greaves, signaling that he wants to go for more of an auto-attack heavy build, going for crit. So a double crit for both sides, that's very interesting. And I am willing, or I am excited to see which crit will crit more. I mean, technically it's going to be Jin right now, just because he is forced to have a crit every four auto-attacks. But, the real power is going to be where they focus their auto attacks on. Meanwhile, there's an aggression on top lane. Yeah, Renekton is getting actually dived on. He is going to pop his ultimate, do a lot of damage onto the Rex side, but Trundle was taking, tanking those turret shots, and this no has no fear trying to get onto this Renekton. And there is three members of the top uh, of this side over here, but four members of the red team as well. Thresh is in here trying to save one of his teammates. So hear me, War will go down. Jinx is the next target. There is no tower here. He is trying his hardest to leave while he does get stunned up by the Zyra. A flash going onto the Trundle. Trundle will go ahead and die to the Jin, actually, saving that last kill for the Jin. And both mid laners are at this bot lane, like duking it out. But it does look like they're going to try to get this top turret for red team. And it looks like they're actually also rotating over towards mid to get the mid tier 1 tower as well, so there could be a tier 2 top and a tier 1 mid. Meanwhile, we can also see that the Fluke is simply counter jungling, trying to get as much objective control as they can in one fell swoop. That was definitely a, an interesting little engagement where Rek'Sai did burrow underneath, but the fear happened, so I guess burrow beats fear any day. Yeah, and... 
I really want to try and just get into the mind of both teams right now because they have builds that are signaling as if they want to go for mid to late game fights, yet they're still keeping this early aggression very high. Most of the way they're going to see these mid to late game fights coming up, or at least being signaled at, is going to be through the item build, specifically of both the mid and the AD carries. As we can see, the crit for the AD carries, and a little bit more of an early defense orientation for Defiled, which typically when you go for that type of build, it's for mid game, not necessarily early game. Early game, you'd more and want something like Merlin Navicon, as we see on Simcron. Well, I am actually really happy to see that the Abyssus of the was picked up on to Diana, but we will see the red team going to go ahead and pick up this three dragon again. We that was very, very scary. I, was... I thought Rex, I actually got that, but no, Diana will pick up the dragon for red team. So that is a wow. Oh. And Warwick actually ends up missing his ultimate while Jin does end up hitting the last bit of his. Three ultimates going down, another one swag and swagger off will kill him. Hear me roar. The teleport from Trundle will be cancelled. And that was very, very interesting. That will be picked I will not die though. The press R to win will hit the Renekton, and Renekton will end up going down. Jinx is so close, wants to get this kill, does not end up hitting the zap, but Jin is very full health. So Jinx has to be careful. Diana is going down for this bot lane tier 2, while Trundle is going for the top lane tier 2 as well. Yeah, so that entire time there was that large amount of aggression, we had a teleport started by Trundle, but he decided to cancel the moment that he saw his team was starting to fall behind in the fight. In the end, the side of St. Olaf decided to go a little too far army to tower and had to pay for it, giving up two lives for the cost of two as well, and they didn't even get the tower for it. However, it delayed enough time for Defile to get the bottom tier 2 turret, Yet it also gave time for Squid to take the top tier two and tier one. Yeah, so, so that was eventually in a little bit in favor of Blue Team just because they did get one extra turret, but Red Team does have one extra turret, so that is a little bit scary to see. But I do like to see that Jinx again being 4 3 against 4, doing a lot of damage going for that Infinity Edge. I'm very interested to see what's gonna happen next. Warwick missing that ultimate is very, very scary. The turn call again onto the Jin, or Jin onto the Jinx actually doing a little bit of damage, kind of like a warning shot saying, hey, we're coming down mid. If anything, maybe a zoning to get potential for his team to try and clear out these wards, because the moment you see a Jin curtain call, you usually get a little scared thinking something's about to come up, and it forces the enemy team away, thinking that aggression's about to come up, and actually... This... Zyra and Renekton are a little too close to the enemies right now, they need to back off, and they are, so that is really good to see, but... Again, this entire time we can see Stwid is just pushing the bot lane, gaining turrets for himself, Right now, St. Olaf has the numbers advantage. They need to go for a fight or something real soon before they're just giving up towers. Alright, well, they are going on to the Baron. They are kind of baiting it out. Half off, half being done. We do see the engage onto the Warwick, actually. No Boots will kill the flu with the press R to win. And Diana actually has to flash out, getting hooked by the Thresh. And that was still a 4v5 with Flub ending up dying, so they will not stop or not keep going for the Baron. And it looks like they still want to keep trying to pick people off and see what happens next. While Trundle is still pushing that bot lane. Yeah, and the main thing that ended up causing the Flub to die off is the fact that he is going in with these alts so aggressively and so far. He's forgetting that he moves incredibly fast with his ultimate. And his team doesn't really have the ability to follow up with it that easily unless if they're already there. It's great for a flanking tool, not necessarily an engaging tool. With an engage, you want to be more lawn drawn out, so that way your team has the ability to follow up. But again, Warwick is too fast for his team to follow up. Yeah, Warwick is a little bit too fast, especially with that Cloud Drake, so 
we will have to wait and see. He might have to try to play the, uh, the cleanup game, maybe, because we do have Renekton and Diana being able to, you know, just go in and initiate for themselves as well. But it yeah. does look like they are, the blue side is going to go ahead and clean up a lot of that, those Baron wards on the red team, as Trundle is yet again back at that bot lane trying to get some turrets. And with these wards, we can see that Zyra is recognizing that Retaliant by going back, refilling her Sight Stone, as well as picking up a few more items. It looks like she wants to go for a Leandri's Torment, or that could also be a uh, Rylai's Crystal Scepter coming up. We'll see once she completes it, because if it goes into a Haunting Guide, then it's obviously Leandri's Torment. But... Ooh, that press R to win, and the <laughs> Super Mega Death Rocket! Hitting directly in the middle, killing Diana. Two ultimates just for the Diana, but that's a big threat off the board. Especially because that's most of the enemy team's wave clear right now. And honestly, in a way that was still a press R to win, it was just two R's for the price of one. And does miss the Jinx, but ends up getting the red side instead. He is gonna go ahead and get away with this while the current call did land. Missing the last auto attack though. And it does see. It, oh, Jin, sorry, did end up getting the kill onto Rek'Sai. Yeah, the Deadly Flourish ended up connecting at just the tip while Kirmi War was trying to back off. So, he's not respecting the full range that Second Rock has the potential of. Granted, he wasn't aiming at Rek'Sai, it was just one of those lucky mishaps. And we see that Stwid took the blue buff from St. Olaf, and now he's going back towards bot lane to continue the pressure. It's a lot of damage. Oh, if if Renekton was not there, that could have been a dead Jin. But Cloud Drake will be the next Drake coming up in the next two seconds and giving a Warwick another Cloud Drake. That's a scary thought. His ultimate is going to extend for a longer range as well as he's going to be super fast to get anywhere and everywhere with his oh. with his blood scent. But because they were doing Cloud Drake, they ended up. Our blue team ended up going for the Baron and are actually gonna end up getting it at the last second as well. And they're gonna disengage, but the team fight is gonna happen. This, we do see that Thresh is gonna go ahead and get caught with the Renekton. Renekton is actually not gonna be able to get him, but we do see Rek'Sai was stalling for the, or uh, was going on the back line and he will get away because of the recall for Baron. So they do end up just losing Thresh, but they do get the Baron in return. And that's definitely worth it for McAllister. Right now they need to do something with this Baron. They need to group up. They need to use the tower taking potential of both Trundle and Jinx in order to force something. They should have Trundle go into the bot lane as they are doing right now. We can see that. But the issue is, is that we don't have Thresh up to offer the vision necessary to make it so that Stuid can safely split push. That is something that you need when you go to split push. If you're not split pushing in an area that is lightened up with wards, then you're simply putting yourself at risk to get flanked off, especially by, as we mentioned before, a Warwick with two Cloud Drakes. That is going to be something that can easily catch people off guard and just simply run at your face until you're dead. Well, it's not even that, his Warwick also has ghosts, so that's going to be even more speed going onto Warwick. But we do see, like you said, they're grouping up. Trundle is actually in this bot lane trying to get this tier 2 bot turret. Renekton is going to go ahead and try to stop him as best as he can, but those Baron Gun minions are going to be doing a little bit of damage while the rest of the team is actually in this mid lane. And we're trying to see who is going to do a lot of damage. Plays going on to Diana, but nothing will come of it. Kind of scary. We do see Jinx doing a little bit of damage to this turret. They are going to do to grab the turret to about half HP, but they are getting helped out really, really hard. So it's going to be very close to see once one of these, what someone gets down to at least half, it's going to there's going to be a trigger and it's going to hurt. And honestly, with how tanky Yumi War is, he could be standing far more forward into the front and simply taking all the shots for his team. Meanwhile, they just have no boots, stay in the back, ready for a pick, but it looks like Curtain Call's going down. Curtain Call is going down the way, both of them going down as well. Diana's in the middle of them, being able to go ahead and kill both, hear me roar, and, sorry, 
Oh, sorry, Warwick was able to kill the Thresh. So Warwick almost dying to the Super Mega Death Rocket. And they're going to go ahead and try to push up a little bit more. Like I said, they were getting poked out too hard. And once they were, they felt like they could win that team fight, they went for it. Yeah, and the biggest issue right there was the fact that they weren't properly zoning off the enemies. They had Rek'Sai waiting on the sideline to look for a flank, when instead they should have had Rek'Sai simply standing in the front, soaking all the damage, while Jinx tries to burn down the tower as fast as possible. No boost, shouldn't even be anywhere near that tower, she doesn't do enough damage to her to really justify right now. So, in all honesty, a lot of that poke damage was done for free, without any real need. Meanwhile, we can see that the Kalsar is getting some opportunities to simply catch the wave switching in towards them and try and get some gold back in their favor. However, St. Olaf is now ahead by about three and a half thousand gold. Most of that gold is stacked onto Swagnarok, who is 6, 1, and 10. And as we can see, he's starting to build off the last Whisper to get ready for the armor that's being built on Henry Lawrence Swift. Yeah, we also do see that the Fire can was built into the Jinx. The Jinx is going to be having the Lincoln a little bit more of a range going or helping her out with those rockets. But we do see, again, the Trundle is in that top lane trying to get something to happen with that split push while the rest of the team is in the mid. But it does look like we're just going to... Go, they are going to go for the bot lane instead because bot lane is getting pushed against them while the rest of the team is kind of huddling around the mid. Yeah, and with the team being right next to mid lane, they could easily try and push up a bit and add some pressure, then rotate over to one of the silent scene as they have Cloud Dragon that would allow them to get that out of combat movement speed working in their favor. But in all honesty, they're much better off looking for picks and going for the uneven fights like they did back in mid lane where they poke first and then all in. That right now is their best bet with the team comp they have, especially because they lack the wave clear to really survive getting pushed into like they were back towards the tier 2 mid tower. Alright, Titanic Hydra is going to be picked up for the Warwick. A little bit of a late pickup, but he is going for that a little bit more tanky damage route. While we do see Diana he is kind of by herself, but does not decide to keep going any more forward. While the rest of the team, rest of blue team is actually the entirety of blue team is going for this mid lane. And they really want it. Yeah, and this time around they have Jinx using the rapid fire cannon in order to poke it down little by little. And Warwick pops his W, trying to look for something to go in on. However, Renekton is still far in the back, so if Warwick tries to go in, he's not really going to have anyone there to help him out. You're absolutely right. He what, we do see that Trundle was trying to back away. Dragon is up in the next 10 seconds. It is another Cloud Drake giving more movement speed to the red team. It's going to be very scary. Well, that's like, it was if... scary enough to have two of them, then we don't need a third. That's if Red Team gets this dragon. Don't forget that right now, both teams are actually here to contest. That's when they only got the second Cloud Dragon just because there was no contest. Yeah, but now that there is a contest, they're kind of hovering around in that choke point, and that's not the place they want to be. They're actually going to get pincered really quick. It looks like Rose is going to try to go onto the Cinder, and he will go on the Cinder. Cinder is going to go down in a heartbeat. Where are you going to go ahead and hold on to the Jinx? Dive the file won't kill the Jinx. Rush is the next one to be the to be dead, and Rek'Sai is the last one alive for them, but it will flash away, and they are not looking for him. Or sorry, for her, they are just going to go ahead and push down mid. Yeah, in all honesty, you don't really have to chase a Rex, she doesn't offer much of a stopping point to any siege. The best you could do would be poking out minions with her Q, which you don't even have to worry about. As you can see, Warwick is thinking enough that he's just saying, screw this tower, I'll tank it. I mean, they have two tanks for now. Diana going in onto the Rex side, not being able to land her Q to get the reset on her ultimate, but it doesn't matter. Red Team is going to go ahead, take the mid in inhibitor, as well as the new turret, and they're gonna go at two Baron as it just spawned. All right, and will they be able to get this Baron this time around? They don't really have any Infernal or Mountain Blings. Not a single one's actually spawned this game, but while they're taking this, is actually a massive minion wave down in the bot lane, taking the 2-2 turret, it does go down. So this will be a Baron for a tower, as long as it can actually get it. Okay, 
The Jim, Super Jim, Mega Death Rocket did not scale right. Jin was not gonna go. There's so many flashes. Warwick is actually the last one in that Dragon Pit. He's gonna do so much damage, almost killing No Boots, but No Boots says, no, I will live and you will die. So Warwick being down for the next 45 seconds with no fear, that's gonna be very, very hard. We will see what blue team is gonna do. And it looks like they're gonna try to go for that cloud to not give him the third and the final cloud upgrade. It may also be doing that to try and rush the amount of time that they have in order to get Elder when it would spawn. That way they don't try and let the game last too long. And in all honesty, I feel like they did that Baron knowing that Defoot would probably die because he is flashless. He's a flashless Warwick, he has no way to get over a wall, and they knew it would be contested right towards the end. So they probably went into that Baron knowing full well Defoot would die and were willing to take that trade off. Because frankly, one teammate to get a Baron on the rest of your allies? I don't know how you would ever say that's not worth it. Well, that's what happened with Luke team. They were able to get, you know, sacrifice the Thresh to have everyone else have Baron for them as well. So I do understand they kind of did the same thing, but we do see Red Team gonna go ahead and, you know, kind of huddle over to the top, getting the Blue Team's uh, blue bomb, as well as most likely get this turret because they do, yet again, they do have those Baroned Up minions, and it's gonna be very hard because mid is still pushing with no inhib and no super minions. Yeah, and now we can see that if you look at the items really quick before any fight breaks out, Jinx has picked up the QSS, which means that Warwick won't be able to as easily try and engage on top of Virgil because she can easily pull it off. That means that now Warwick will want to change his target most likely over to no boots, and it will be Defiled hopping onto Jinx instead, just because you don't really have anything to do with some of that, and meanwhile, he might break it out. The hook just landed onto Rex Connor to Renekton, and Renekton taking a lot of damage, hitting the press R to win for Cinder. Actually, Warwick going onto the trundle, making an interesting choice here. We were, will take out the Renekton, but Jin and Diana taking out the other carries. Very interesting right there as well. Diana actually is gonna go ahead, get another kill. Sorry, Jim getting another kill, getting the triple for himself. And it is just Trundle up by himself with Zyra, Diana, and Jin being the threat. They need to rotate over the mid lane right now if they want to try and go for an end. If they're not going to be able to go for the end, then they should rotate top instead to try and go for another inhibitor turret. But it looks like they're going for the end. They should not waste time trying to pick off this Trundle. Don't waste time. You do not oh, have to they got it. It doesn't mind, matter. The Zonies is going to be pumped as well. Big up. Minions, the Baron is still on him, it doesn't matter. That's game going over to St. Olaf. GG's all around. Alright, and as you said, that's game three going over to St. Olaf. I believe that means that St. Olaf is now three and two. Let me just double check. Yep, St. Olaf is now three and two. Macalstar is now two and three. So sadly, it did not go the way you wanted to. I know you want to have it where the underdogs were to win again, but. I mean, the underdogs are there for a reason. Just gotta say. Are, are you are you sure Saint Olaf? Saint Olaf is four and one. No, no, I just I just changed that. Yeah, Olaf Saint being Olaf being four and one. You said they were three and two. Oh wait, did D I say that? Does it doesn't matter? Well, I, Congratulations I, I messed up. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Congratulations yeah. to Saint Olaf. You did an amazing job. Definitely, that was definitely a close game. No boots doing a lot of damage. Stride doing you know being able to take down right net of faker being able to stop floof as well even though i really wanted to see this jinx kind of get into that late game you know <laughs> kill everything over and over and over again it was the flube that will i to be honest will be my mvp because he's able to cc anyone he was everywhere every time there was a gank every time there was anything any one of his teammates were gonna die he was there he got that team started he was able to get that gin to 11 1 and 12. geez like if anyone else would have gotten that mvp it would have been that gin knowing where to sit knowing when to use his ultimate being able to get kill after kill after kill that just shows you that crit gin is still good now I'm actually going to give my MVP over to someone else, and it's not Jin or Warwick. It's actually going to go to the Defiled, just because of one simple thing. You're mentioning that Jinx was that Lake and Carry threat. She did have that potential, 
but every single team fight we would see defiled either jumping onto no boots or the condor and simply deleting them instantly every single time in a team fight you're calling out that either no boots or the condor were going down in a blink of an eye and you know who was causing it defiled and that is the main reason why i'm giving it over to defiled just because it was him doing all that work to make sure the biggest threats were going down instantly you're absolutely right i mean everyone here did a fantastic job even the enemies even uh mick allister did a fantastic job as well but that will be the last game of tonight do you have anything else to say for today because i mean that was that was really good for week five i mean the start of week five for the start of week five i have to say those were some amazing games i loved how close they were that was that's my biggest point i want to point out these games were really close and last thing to point out again I look forward to seeing how well UMD can do with their roster change going into the future with how great of a showing they had at the start of this week. All right. Well, that will be the end of the MNLCS for today. Please come back on Thursday to check us out for the next games that will be coming up. I believe we will start off if I could go ahead and look down for this schedule. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. There we go. It will be ganked by Gophers versus Winona to start off to our uh, Thursday. St. Cloud versus Mavericks to be that second game. And Pupper Dogs versus Gustavus. I almost messed that up. To be the last game of Thursday. So do stick around for that being at 7 p.m. Central Time. And then, you know, if you're anywhere else, do the math. You guys are smart little cookies. But that's me. I'm Dreamer775. I'm going to be signing off today. Fen Fen, that was fun. I believe you have one more thing to say before we head out today. Yes, of course. I always have to remind the people that the MNLCS is brought to you by Invade, bringing some of the best apparel to the state of Minnesota. Go ahead and check them out. They have their own Facebook page. And honestly, they have some really great gear to wear. Good night, everyone.